Chapter 291 Days cooped up in my flying tin can generate a different experience compared to similar trips in the past. The wind buffeting and turbulence at very low altitudes are stronger, but that is trivial to ignore. Instead, the largest difference comes from what I exude. Usually, any smell from me or any other system user is barely perceptible, even during times of stress, but this time several factors conspired together to make my body odor truly vile. The situation is worse than usual, and I have to wait for days. The system's interference is fading from my body. It used to suppress the negative sides of our biological functions, making them less noticeable, but that is mostly gone. Being stuffed in such a small space simply amplifies it all to my acute nose. Over a thousand perception points make the experience almost unbearable. With the changes the system made to our bodies, even after days without a shower running and fighting, caked in blood and sweat, only the barest of smells could be felt. Milder than most people before the system after an hour-long run. But that suppression is gone for me. Strangely, I'm happy about that. It's not perfect for every circumstance. I do need to tune it correctly and hope I don't run into a dog that can track by smell. But my gut was positively giddy at having another feedback avenue back. Different types of pain in the body let me know when I'm pushing too hard. Different tastes gave me insight into the nutritional value of the food I ate. And smells, which are made up of thousands of chemical compounds released through my pores provide a robust layer of feedback. I take one more breath before letting more air inside to clear out the smell. I shouldn't allow myself to get too accustomed to this particular smell, otherwise, my brain would simply start filtering it out in the future and the very feedback I seek will be gone. Finding a better intensity, I try to parse out what this smell tells me. I'm not on a relaxing vacation to pick up recruits up in South America or the North Pole, instead of sending over hundreds of flying buses. No. I'm needed somewhere else and each second that I delay threatens disaster. The enemy even managed to capture a second pyramid with a massive wave of reinforcements by surprising our side with more system shenanigans, but that is where we stopped them. So I need to get there as soon as possible. During my trip, the end of the month had come and another batch of people arrived from the instance while the enemy got their stream of reinforcements. Our attacks on the elves forced a higher mana expenditure and for the first time, we started to see their territory diminishing ever so slightly which encouraged us. But their defenses and the suppression in the huge area around their city forced us to move in and out to avoid exhausting our own forces. Over the horizon, the pyramid's tops pop out of the ground. The trip is nearly over and I don't even bother with fancy maneuvers, simply waiting until I'm close enough before putting the craft back in the inner world. I drop at a relatively slow speed compared to my flight and hit the ground at a speed that would have turned even my own strong bone structure before integration into broken glass. Now I only leave a pair of foot-shaped indents in the hard-packed soil near the core of the enemy's invasion. Nash, says the general that came in the rocket with the first wave of reinforcements stepping out of the command tent. I turn to him while opening up hundreds of portals in strategic locations and let out the roughly 10 million reinforcements in the inner world out. Are you ready for an assault? I ask, both as a real question and for the show as the inhabitants of the city look at me. Wait a minute. We appreciate all the help and we are going to attack, but the plans you came up with are incomplete. You had three days since I started my flight. I only need a few hundred of my elites to rush the corridor in the Queen's Pyramid. The only decision I had to make was if I should risk going for the larger pyramid where there is a higher failure change but with the larger number of people and the danger they would be exposed, the smaller one is probably a better alternative. I, a few speechless people in their traditional garb, simplified compared to the old turbans and nearly ceremonial clothing given the resilience we gain to heat, the sun, and other environmental effects. But culture is a meaningful part of our heritage as humans and I can clearly see on that while not universal, plenty over here aren't really ready for battle. The very fact that they are any non combatants just a hundred meters from the front line just reveals the aspect of their mentality and, for lack of a better framework, immaturity. But to be fair, they weren't expecting their city to become part of the front lines anytime soon, if at all. Not an unforgivable mistake. That isn't my place, but puts things in perspective. A minute before, elite Egyptian melee fighter POV. I run out of my tent after hearing the thump against the ground. 
With the memory of rattling bones fresh in my mind, I look around until I spot the picture of power, wearing a root armor and talking with our leaders. Nash, we don't have much of our old tech back, and there are weird holes in the creature comforts we took for granted. But although the quirks that magic replacements allowed meant some very few had fully working electronics, pictures, and holographic interfaces are everywhere and I had seen him. In this new world, he is probably the most well-known person on the planet. The latest rising star. Even if only a tenth of his contributions are real, he is always going to be remembered. I feel the grass rustling my armor as it bends in his direction ever so slightly. Someone without context would dismiss it, but that aura thick with power and unreleased action warps the world around him even without him taking notice. He is like a mouse trap, but if anyone triggers it, it won't sprain a finger. It will cut them off even if they are steel-plated. My arms heating up and getting ready for action at the mere thought of talking to him, but I don't approach. I have nothing to say. Still, there is something more in the air. Maybe it is always surrounding him, but I need to witness him in action. So I follow the group he selects to assault the queen's pyramids the enemy took over. His aura thickens up as he focuses on his actions. Maybe the ether I heard about. Maybe something else. It concentrates and shifts in nature. A sharper aura that is ready to cut ending any problem that arises. Ready to fix our mistake of assuming the enemy is limited in its tricks. I can almost feel my thoughts being influenced in his wake, but I just follow behind ready to lend my support should it be needed as the orders go around the camp. This smaller pyramid only has a single entryway, and it is now significantly different compared to a week ago. The near ruin that had been missing half its stone was restored by the system. Not completely, as there is no smooth white limestone covering, but the foundation matches the best recreations of the original our archaeologists and engineers came up with. He approaches it slowly and steps up to the only entrance, before beginning to grow thousands of roots from his own armor. Having read about his technique and approximations that a few of the more talented nature mages could do with faux inner worlds gives me a little more context for the source of that mass, but it is still an impressive display. He bounces on the balls of his feet, pulsing his muscles from resting position to flying a couple of feet in the air each time. If he extended his feet all the way even without involving his knee he could jump insane heights, but he gradually limits his range of motion until it is only a few millimeters long while he still bounces about a meter high. Then as if they had coordinated that action a thousand times, his next bounce is much faster heading to the entry of the corridor followed by his backup. Using all his range of motion, he rushes the entry of the corridor faster than any sprinter, even with the system. His fist crashes against the outer shield of the corridor. Each punch glows with power, though I can tell that it is not from any skill that melee classes tend to have. Instead, he uses something that isn't mana while punching the shield over and over. A rhythm forms as roots around him work on and attacks fly at that narrow corridor, only wide enough for a single human to fight in. But it is not the rhythm of a song, but a high-speed metronome. That's at least six or seven punches each second with perfectly smooth form, and each one could blow holes through mere steel doors if they were using common materials. His feet are glued to the ground, and each blow only grows stronger reaching even beyond my best with minutes to prepare. My meager mana senses can't directly feel the shield strain, nor the recharge rate, but the places he punches down don't simply change colors from transparent to whitish as in the first few seconds. Each punch leaves deeper and deeper indents until damage fully outpaces repair. The enemy's shield falls into a vicious cycle. The cracks widen and I certainty of success arrives. The elves inside keep attacking him through the shield, but Nash's own shield manages to protect him against the attacks from the couple of magic users that can attack in the narrow corridor. That shield must be from the system. Otherwise, I would feel the river of mana rushing to replenish it. The mana input must be in the central room, while the system takes care of the rest. The elven druids give way to a sword fighter who chops at Nash's hand probably hoping to delay him or even force a retreat to give them the time to come up with a better defense strategy. Even half an hour might be enough to give them a breather. The shield locks his fist in place. If he simply relaxes his fist he would be able to slide right out. Maybe he wants to use the interface to directly take it down. Instead, he seems to not do anything. Holding completely still until the very last moment, 
when he twists his forearm with a pulse of his resources and manages to pinch the sword between his fingers in a fluid and precise motion. He's in control. There is no doubt that he could have done that a thousand times in a row without losing a finger. A flick of his wrist disarms the surprised fighter, and a moment later the enemy is left bleeding with his own sword used against him. Nash pushes Chi out, and a concussion wave blasts the shield, then another and another. Attacked in such a way, the shield isn't nearly as strong and in mere seconds it falls entirely. I simply watch in all while on the edge of the formation and get ready even as a few others enter right behind Nash, who mows down the enemy with relative ease. The internal defenses start to activate in earnest and Nash's own defenses are put to the test. Not the pathetic workings of the five druids that can reach him or the childlike swing of a nod-led arm elves when compared to Nash's strength, but the defenses that could force even our most advanced weaponry back. If we were willing to trade lives for lives, we might have been able to hold our assault at least this smaller pyramid and eventually take it back, but after we retreated, they managed to erect this shield. If they didn't have as many reinforcements as they could fit inside the pyramid's central chamber, which for the elves after their construction of several levels seemed to be around 10,000 for the larger pyramid and a couple hundred over here. But those numbers are nearly instantly replaced through portals each time an elf dies. We have recreated videos of those portals in action, courtesy of Nash's seeds who have been scouting the enemy since they captured the pyramid. Now the enemy has no escape nor more tricks to pull not against Nash simply mowing them down amidst a sea of magma, fire, lightning, and other exotic types of energy. He bathes in it like he is walking through the rain. He closes his eyes to avoid the occasional splash, and he holds his backpack close to his body to avoid wetting the papers inside, but he is on a mission and won't be stopped by something as simple as deadly attacks. His hands punch, twist, and fold before he pulls his staff out to use a spell, and instantly the staff is back in his inner world a cycle that repeats a thousand of times. His staff may have good magical bonuses, but it's simply too unwieldy for combat in the narrow space. It's only a matter of time before Breach the enemy is driven out. Nash disappears from my view as he gets too deep in the corridor, but I know in my heart that what I witnessed will be replicated until there isn't anyone standing against him. Chapter 292 I waddle through the enemy on the Yellowstone Corridor not exactly the same as it had been before the system's arrival, as it had been repaired and modified. Now growing to be just high enough for most humans to walk upright with bins that provide way more protection than a straight line. The tone of the rock and the way its maintenance match with the earlier class trials, but that seems at most a curiosity. I feel an invisible weight on top of the visible ether streams floating and bending around my own ether field. This weight had initially been even weaker than the less important Himalayan mountains and or the few pyramids tops I landed on to get my Wonders of the World titles, but entering the corridor made that impression significantly stronger. Though this shift seems to have been prompted by the enemy's unlocking of the pyramid. The thousands of roots covering my body and a good portion of my surroundings are stained in blood. My armor in desperate need of repairs as I regrow it, and the flesh underneath each time the powerful system enhanced defenses get through my defenses in this confined space. But I keep stepping forward. I sense. Not panic, but surprise infused in the elves' every action. They didn't expect this level of power. Even after witnessing me in action in the middle of their battlefield several times, few actually managed to strike at me with enough force to reveal how high my constitution stat was. I technically had others backing me now, but my raw capabilities are on display without giving the enemy any opening to exploit. Concentrated power that is enhanced by the stat formation on my back. Similar to Alex's armor, but mine isn't buffing speed. Instead, from the three engraved options, I choose a couple of extra percent in constitution to beef up my last layer of defense. Enough mana to power a small fortress drives the formation on the back as my other half spares the barest of attention to keeping a thread of QI further empowering it. He also sends a second stream of chi enhancing my personal shield which breaks every couple of seconds under the strain of powerful attacks. Each time the enemy gets through, my skin boils and flakes off while a stream of life flows from my core and instead of retreating, I can heal just about fast enough to keep myself advancing. Even with my huge pool of health, each attack eats into it, destroying muscle layers 
and without constant regeneration, it would eventually get to my bones, ending any chance I have, but for now, the tenuous balance is in place. My mode of attack was supposed to be impossible, but if I can't survive it, my flesh can be the sacrifice instead of the lives of thousands of our best fighters. We don't have to resort to charging over the corpses of our comrades. Not even our best healers would change that fact. We would need to send them pretty close to danger, and each one would at most delay the inevitable end for a few of our fighters. The danger they would be exposed to is quite significant given that not a single one amongst them has a ranged heal skill. Even at touch range their efficiency and speed are atrocious which means that wasn't an option. With only six healers in the public eye, and at least one more I had found being hidden by their country, each one is treasured. But once again I broke conventions. Speed. Strength. Damage resistance. Chi skills. Multitasking ability and extremely efficient healing. My advantages wouldn't last forever, especially if I rest on my laurels and saw fit to push my responsibilities with my belly, but I won't do that. I push for more, for variety leaning on the odd powers others couldn't explore and taking them to new heights. Ether wielders like myself are supposed to be able to break a few conventions and accelerate their learning. I just took an unconventional path there even amongst my own kind. Though in direct combat, I'm probably not at the same level as a few of the stronger ones out there. Directly ending these many lives weighs on me. I know they are invaders and the rational part of my mind tells me I shouldn't be wasting time ruminating on it, but in the end, I still have to account for all my actions. Each death may be a little stain on my soul, but I chose this path. So I simply steal my heart and walk over the corpses absent-mindedly sending them to a scavenging station in the inner world. The metal and inherent value of the equipment aren't anything impressive, but the cost isn't negligible. It isn't like steel, copper and silver have no use. They just aren't enough to be a meaningful incentive to go out farming. Well, maybe for the most sociopathic percentage of our population. But if I'm already here, no sense in letting it all go to waste as metal vapors from the very attacks of the enemy. The corridor barely reaches 20 meters, but somehow traversing it is a slog even for me. Several minutes and hundreds of deaths mount making their desperation clear. Then any pretense of skill is gone as I approach the end of the corridor. The people at the back press their bodies like this is a Japanese subway train trying to push me, but even if that forces me to change how I approach they aren't trying to push someone with 50 or 100% stronger. No, I have a lot more power at my fingertips. This isn't even where I most shine as I push forward their mass with no concern for their safety. That pressure both from the environment and the bodies pressing against me builds until I hear a pair of pops. One from a cracked rib and another broken ulmer as the elves at the back push without mercy. Flames shoot out from the tiny holes in the walls on some of the last defenses that the system built in that corridor. The ground is so slick with blood in any spot that the fire hasn't touched would have even a gymnast sliding uncontrollably. But I don't play by normal rules. I grow hand and footholds everywhere, and when that isn't possible, she is a wonderful help in gluing my hands or feet to the ground. I brace my feet while pushing the enemy forward with such strength that I could probably bench press a bus. It takes another few seconds, but then I get the leverage and take another half step forward. The mages and frontline fighters at my back keep advancing now protected from the defenses after I survive them. My roots grow to match my movement precisely, a single step from their last defense and the end of the corridor. The panic that centuries of training and experience they managed to hold back until now rears its ugly head as the weakest link breaks. The closest thing to a full-blown panic attack I have seen from the enemy manifest as I reach the open ground and with another pulse of life. Chi and vigor through my veins, I push. Two more steps with my arms wide open in the small central chamber open up space for the people at my back to fan out. That is the moment that the cycle of elves coming and leaving from the other pyramid to recharge the mana batteries to power the defenses ends. Combating me to any reasonable degree demanded a huge mana consumption. They couldn't recharge the batteries at a sufficient rate, not with the couple dozen people that fit in this small chamber. It's definitely not tall enough for them to build several levels. They didn't have enough time to fill the batteries with mana, so that portal to the other pyramid is essential in their plans. Slumped shoulders, kneeling elves, and even a few dropping their weapons in a sign of surrender as others simply keep attacking me. Then, 
My own anger manifests as a pair of elves start swinging weapons at the ones trying to surrender, but I won't allow that. With the strongest kinetic blast I can summon I create then prop up strong shields thicker than anyone would consider reasonable. They aren't intended to be flexible or to work in a small corridor against the formations in place. Nor do they need to be permeable to my attacks. All I need is to protect the ones that gave up for a slip second. The restrictions of the system and space slowly lift as more people enter the small central chamber and I open portals into the inner world to allow the four people who clearly surrendered a path to safety. Then I free myself and explode with chi and roots covering the entire place. Their home ground advantage is gone. Seeing that fighting is futile, elves in the eight meters wide chamber all end up either surrendering or fleeing through the portal. A moment later, I step forward to touch the portal myself. I know it's dangerous, but the opportunity won't come again. Reaching just a kilometer, I can feel the minuscule mana consumption. All my senses analyze both ends. With the help of the system, the mana consumption is downright cheap compared to maintaining the longer range portal one between Elf City in the US and the Great Pyramid of Giza over here. The principles behind it are incredible when compared to the much more primitive portals we used to cross between instances during the tutorial. I could feel aspects of the wonder at a distance, but even as incredible as the perception field is, standing a couple of meters away provides a different type of feedback. It has a weight I simply couldn't feel from a distance that my natural sense of space picks up on. A crazy idea pops into my head as the elves take the mana away from the connection waiting for it to collapse. So I send both chi and mana to try and keep the portal open. If could keep it open, assaulting the other pyramid would be one hell of a lot easier. I try to get a deeper feel for the portal, forcefully shoving tens of thousands of mana and chi to try and balance that. But while the other side doesn't fully understand what is happening without a space mage to directly operate the portal, their surprised faces reveal they know something is wrong. A smile starts to form in my head, even as I feel the strain from attempting to keep the portal open. But that smile freezes a second later, just when I think that I have it under my control. They proactively cut the connection, and the portal instantly destabilizes. Like a switch being flicked, the path is gone leaving only dangerous disturbances in the intervening space. When they saw that clamping the fuel line to the car engine wasn't enough to kill it, they pulled all the electric cables preventing even a single more detonation cycle. Without any sparks, the fuel can't burn and even if the engine is still moving, it's in a death spiral. It can't regain any of the momentum lost. I engrave each moment in my memory, trying to keep it all in mind, given I probably won't have such an opportunity again to observe and interact with both ends of the portal at the same time. The runes that had been powering our side fade away, just before the last vestiges of the system's restrictions completely fade. The significance of our actions strikes at me. We recovered the One Pyramid. Now, we are the ones that will have the system defenses on our side, says a mage happily poking everywhere, trying to find how to control the pyramid. I join in, walking around, touching the empty sarcophagus, the walls, art, and anything that might have a system interface. I pull up my screen while trying to feed mana into the pyramid stores. The minutes pass without result and somehow I know. We got a plain toy without the batteries. I sit for a minute growing defenses while the fighters inside give way to engravers to enhance the defenses, add mana storage and connections should the enemy try to take the pyramid again. This time, even if they manage to get a hundred people in the perfect position to assault this position, they will have to contend with proper defenses runic arrays to reinforce everyone inside powerful turrets, and at least a few dozen melee fighters already fully armed and armored. As the minutes pass, no one gets any closer to realizing how the enemy unlocked the pyramid or interfaced with the system. Things aren't this simple, are they? The system hasn't told us what to do. Our method of unlocking the pyramids has to be different. Everyone's faces grow gloomier at the inherent truth of my words, but they don't give up the search. My mind turns over everything I know, and I use some of the very carefully saved up potential in my book to get a clue. Leaving the chamber and climbing to the top of the pyramid, I sit turned to our remaining enemies. The conditions that allowed me to bulldoze the defenders on this pyramid don't really exist on the Great Pyramid of Giza. The corridors are wider, and now my sneaking suspicion about how close I would be to my limit is proven. I don't have enough of a power reserve to assault that position. I flip my first reward from the system. 
a book with infinite pages. Even now, it carries more information than most libraries, but still only a fraction of human-generated knowledge. As I feel the pool of potential take a substantial dip, I read the words. The native's method of unlocking ether icons is unique to each planet. Damn, I had hints of this, but damn. Chapter 293 I ponder on how to unlock the pyramid a second time. The enemy had done that before with our ether icon, but it went inert after we pushed them out. Trying to replicate what they did is fruitless. We will have to find our own method, but without any clues, I keep climbing another set of stairs under much more danger. A more immediate part of the problem needs my focus, something that I believe is all but hopeless, but if I figure out how to do it without being in too much danger, we will push the enemy back thousands of kilometers. Twenty months since our return, and we seem to have permanently lost a big piece on the chessboard. The small corridor on the first pyramid only fit one human, which made the fight considerably different. Climbing the Great Pyramid of Giza, I mentally organize what a full assault would mean. At least five lines, one by my side in the main corridor, and two lines in each of the other corridors. Under such conditions, even our strongest fighters would get chewed up. With weaker system defenses, or if I was stronger, I could probably just widen my stance and make use of the extra space to give me freedom of movement. I may even be able to bring more equipment with me to make up some of that gap, but even if I could probably get that edge on the enemy in a couple of months of training, the enemy wouldn't be at a standstill each day, they grow stronger as the system slowly lifts the restrictions. This simple pyramid is in many ways the strongest fortification on our planet. The system's attacks are insane. Its shields recharge faster than anything we could build and the enemy had time to prepare knowing exactly what my strategy is with a much larger manpower pool. I taste how solid the mana of the first shield layer is. It rings stronger than yesterday when I broke it with the huge formation I dragged up here. With space and the help of a few mages, it was almost trivial. Deeper inside, however, I will be much more limited. I glance at the new contraption that we had no hope of fitting in there let alone make the bins. Not unless we used so much mithril I made it portable, along with enough of the metal to protect its internal structure. Otherwise, the very system would see it destroyed before we got to the first turn in the zigzagging path. The corridors were probably the most significant change to the pyramid's original layout, made by the system though far from the only one. Even if I somehow managed to make a fireball or some other type of attack that could switch directions mid-air multiple times, which would allow as much support from outside the pyramid as we wanted, the internal formations and systems restrictions would definitely destabilize it. It seems as if the very system wanted to provide a fortress without any weak points refined over the eons. I send my chi and will into the machine at my back and an extremely powerful if unfocused beam of space strikes the shield. Then it cycles to fire, lightning, and a few other exotic forms of energy we had seen from the enemy both intended to break the enemy's shield and to measure the effects. Cracks form in seconds, with my other half recording the entire process in my memory. Then the enemy finishes their own preparations. A single fireball, with a few hints of earth, but so focused that it resembles more magma than an actual fire spell shoots out aiming for my head. But I'm well protected and it strikes our formation, cracking the small shield and eating a chunk of the wood and steel. A crater on the outer runes reduces the effectiveness of our attack, but only by a marginal amount collapsing the enemy's shield in another few seconds. I slowly make my way back doing my best to protect the team of mages with me. With all the equipment I could produce or order from our craftsmen, it took something the size of a bus to crack the enemy's shield in short order. Without it, I would be stuck in a kill trap without the firepower or the defenses to be an effective threat. Even with my recovery and toughness, Waves of attacks meant to instantly kill several people at my level and leave only ash behind is too dangerous for my taste. I would either have to spend an inordinate amount of life to just hold still and probably be forced to retreat. Yes, I have enormous pools of stats, but the enemy's position doesn't just give them a small edge in combat, they sit on a true fortress. Ether icons don't seem like the type of place to be lost except with overwhelming differences in power or incompetence on the part of the defenders. I need a fundamental change in the dynamics or a way to pull a giant rabbit out of a hat. This time it seems not even my inner world shenanigans aren't going to be enough. 
It almost seems easier to kill and capture most if not all elves in their city to staunch the flow of reinforcements, and only them come over here to finish the job. Maybe there might be another option such as draining their mana to a low enough level and shutting down their defenses. Half an hour later, I leaf my book of knowledge atop the Queen's Pyramid. After having gotten as much knowledge about ether icons as I was willing to spend, I read the intervening pages, trying to find the tidbits of knowledge written on it that might be useful for me in the sea of information I cram on it every day. My mind turns over the problem, or rather the dozens of problems on my plate, all with unsatisfying answers. After another few fruitless minutes, I return the leather-bound engraved book to the pedestal, ready to absorb everything of value that we hold. Hopefully, it will replace whatever I used up to learn very little. I didn't get even a hint of how to unlock the pyramid below me. If I dedicated my time to it, I might succeed, but there are a thousand other paths that I could take that are a better use of my time. This doesn't feel like a path I'm meant to walk. Then a unique opportunity manifests. I feel slight changes on the portal of the enemy just a kilometer away. I had idly looked at it before, but something interesting and that might teach me more than passively watching it while increasing its mana usage by striking the space cord. I wouldn't crack those secrets in a single day, but that doesn't matter. If I can simply take another few steps, I would eventually figure it out. Connecting to it as closely as my perception field allows, I trace each line created, maintained, and infused with mana by the system. There is a fundamental imbalance, as the elf city disproportionately sends mana through to power both sides. This one is only meant to keep itself stable. Even in standby mode, the other side used millions of mana each second to sustain the portal open and billions of mana each second while transporting someone. But that's only a burden to the huge number of elves on the other side who can afford it. Over here, the couple of living goblins and elves only pull a few dozen points per second from the system's stores. My estimates aren't perfect, I still can't directly sense mana being used by the system except in the final step, but it shouldn't be too far off. I open tiny inner world portals trying to maneuver as close to the spots outside the pyramid that are twisted to allow for travel, but the distance from their portal seems to protect it ever so slightly. Still, my natural space manipulation powers come in handy to strike at the long string of space as I impart more and more momentum to the cord, making it ring out louder and louder, increasing the amount of mana they need to input into it. Conjuring up a song and story of dissonance, my new class and skill creep into everything I do making my actions more impactful. I won't get to anything so overwhelming they can't afford it anytime soon, but with some work, I every smidge more of mana they have to spend when measuring in the billions, it will make a difference. Even if it feels like an empty victory. Inside the inner world, the team working with me on portal experiments slowly wakes up and gets in place, drawing more formations and trying to further refine our current understanding of the runes used to achieve such effects. The only one who had actually unlocked the space-time manipulation skill, though still at skill level 17 size loudly barely an hour into work and I go over his work. I take my mind off the large engraving I was molding loosely mint as a teleporter, like the one used to bring me the bread loaves inside my class trial. Are you trying to cram as many direct space runes as you can in the same engraving? I ask, genuinely confused. I'm trying to understand how they interact with each other. If they were all the same dialect I feel like would have already figured it out, but it is like trying to speak redneck, Caribbean, the old tongue mixed with half a dozen other variations. All of them may technically be English but they don't melt. This is giving me a headache. You know that if you tried to turn that on it would explode in a rather spectacular fashion? Yeah, yeah. I'm not stupid. Just an idle thought. No need to threaten the planet with my stupid experiments. As he says that, my own mind turns over the possibilities. I think that you are onto something. A way to get traction under our wheels. We have been with little progress not induced by external information in one way or another for a while. Won't it be dangerous? We can mitigate that, I say while drawing a sphere around his blueprint. He bulges out his eyes. And we aren't in the instance. We can put it inside one of the isolated pockets. Why didn't I think of that? It's so obvious. His grin builds and builds I leave my current and actually go to implement the design even if I can see that it's not finished. With a few hasty connections to make sure all the runes are connected to the mana supply, though without the same level of care and balancing he had been trying to achieve previously, 
I stream the results so that we can both look at it. As I'm about to turn it on, I think better of it and move the bubble of space in the void of my inner world than I pack it with dirt and erect a few space tune shields, just in case. Most things were absolutely safe in their own pocket of the inner world, but I might just discover something I don't want to do with this experiment. If it somehow managed to jump and damage another bubble with people or important documents, I would cry. By now dozens of other researchers are around me intent on extracting all the data they can. I glance at the portal in the enemy occupied pyramid seeking inspiration and throwing a few points of my chi into the mix which shouldn't interfere with the results except to give me more control over what is happening. I look at the underlying structure of the portal runes, the magical property that system users impart into the physical with their runic engraving skill. Or a similar type of skill such as the one I invented runic language. Each point of mana and chi pushes it closer to the edge. A simple nudge in the wrong direction would collapse the whole thing, killing the roots holding the runes in place. The warping of space is so direct and dissonant compared to the stable bridge of the system. Even the song of dissonance I ring on it sounds like a masterpiece compared to whatever I'm doing here. Then it is too much, and even the dead remnants of wood crumble. A dull echo of pain hits my soul as the small space distortion explodes and nearly phases through the thin shield mint to protect against a few dozen mana and a couple of chi points fed into it. I stare at my hand wondering why it didn't even give me the level of working control I had come to expect from my own resources after the runes faded. That's new. I hear from my counterpart. Indeed. It mostly phased through the dirt and the shields, and it hit the outer walls of the pocket with way more strength than I expected. We need to properly tune the shield and figure out how it happened. Well, given the inherent instability, moving it to a larger pocket is probably the best thing. A meter of travel to the edge is not enough time to properly dissipate the power. We need at least 10 times that distance of dirt. I still want a space tune shield that works against space phenomena. Come on, no need to be a douche. I designed a decent shield. I prod at the phantom sense of pain this little taste of what could have been, and that would be if I screw up my experimentation while pushing more power. Nope. Not being a douche. You have no idea how painful soul wounds are, and this whole endeavor screams of torturous pain if it goes awry. I want the shield and a few other extra precautions. The wall of my inner world has a high tolerance to all kinds of stuff, but this shouldn't exist. We work in dozens of similar designs testing everything and figuring out not what works, but how to break those runes and by consequence how much we can push them, which ones don't go together, which ones are more effective, and the critical weaknesses we need to armor over. The pocket of space I create in the end is about 30 meters wide with multiple layers of a properly tuned shield and loads of packed dirt, stone even a layer of a steel alloy that sounds promising to replace deep teal in higher-end applications. With an abundance of caution, we even push the envelope. Even if layers of protection fail, I should still keep my soul intact. Putting on a gauntlet of both cut and raw gems, I pass my chi through one of the best raw gems I've found which is compounded by all the small gains of my skills and ways of handling my chi. I learned way more than I expected in a couple of days, but all things come to an end. New understandings and insights arrive more sparsely. Each hasty experiment that taught us a dozen things at the start needed a lot of tuning to only point in the direction of the next experiment. I reached a higher tier of skill and I got a rather large team moving in the right direction, but it's time to move on. Already? Yes, I'm not well suited to simply work on a single thing. I will keep tabs and help out a couple of hours each week, but I need to clear my head now. I do have a dozen projects staring at my face, begging for attention. The faces of the researchers, a single one of which actually managed to achieve something that no one on Earth, as far as I knew, had accomplished, turning the very simple space-slash-time interaction skill into space manipulation as I had. With the help of a few talented seeds, it should be enough to keep their progression steadily climbing. I take a couple of steps out of the newly built research center in the diplomatic grounds and my compressed spine relaxes ever so slightly. Walking on the ground, through a place with much less uniformity than I would expect of the steel, concrete, and glass in old Earth's modern buildings. Now, the reforming cities are different in shape, appearance, and modes of construction. From my vantage, I see buildings ranging from solid rock shaped by stone singers in a medieval style, past forest dwellings, 
resembling the ones I build with living wood all the way to near copies of our old architecture. Occasionally I see even more daring designs given the options opened up by magic. Floating pieces, illusions, and more are just the common choices for those who have the money to spare and the willingness to experiment. Ready to explore whatever the world has to offer, I take off the mantle of Earth's protector from my shoulders for a little while to walk in freedom amidst the maelstrom of people. Chapter 294 I walk about half an hour in search of something. I had planned to spend a few minutes just following whatever path seemed interesting before taking a meandering path back, but there was something in the air. I can almost feel the ether building, and instead of doing my usual trick of blanketing the entire area with my presence with the perception field, I just use my other senses. I pace forward. For the hundredth time, looking back trying to spot the source as a pinprick of attention gets to me, as if somebody was staring at me. But amidst the thousands of people around me, the slightly more intent gaze gets lost. Still, it isn't random. That gaze carries a unique intent, though I can't stop my pursuer simply with my eyes. So I keep going, hoping whoever it is. I walk past hundreds of shops, selling everything that I could imagine, from the deadliest implement their crafters could forge to bath sponges and extra strong scented soap meant to clean some of the vilest body fluids caked on after a long day fighting. Few in the region had seen more than a token amount of fighting before the pyramid takeover, but they learned and after over a week, they had adapted. Yada, yada. Buy my soap? I mentally translate the Arab words in my head from the owner of one of the little stalls. Even if I don't recognize a single word, his meaning couldn't be clear. After I show no interest, he looks at me defeated. For a moment I think of acquiescing simply to share a hint of the wealth I had accumulated back into the economy but I smother that impulse a moment later. Even without relying on the perception field, my eyes catch the muscle twitches and his mild attempt at manipulating me. Understandable, but I won't reward that. Not when the product I had in my hand was simply a curiosity that I don't have the mildest need or desire to acquire. I simply shake my head, reapplying in broken Arabic. No interested. I sense his wish to curse me escaping for wasting his time, but he outwardly keeps his temper in control and moves on to the next customer coming to browse his shop, this time a native and someone that I feel a lot more susceptible to his tactics, though I don't feel guilty as it looks to be someone that actually needed the goods on sale. My leisurely pace simply takes me all around, but I get no closer to figuring out who is pursuing me without cheating. The path of the crowd limits my movements and the constraints of a large number of people in the streets even without cars. Those had slowly made a comeback, but without enough roads, they were mostly intended to transport things usually in medium distances, instead of avoiding the trivial mile-long jog to most people now, faster than back in the day to boot. I grow dissatisfied with the game, so I need to fundamentally change it, otherwise, even if I win it, it will come down to simple luck. I catch a glimpse of a very nice path completely free of people, atop a balcony only six meters off the ground. Now. That is what I'm talking about. I don't hesitate, erecting a mild and flexible shield around myself, clearing a circle with a meter and a half wide. That should stop limbs from getting broken after swinging in my path while I jump. With a push carrying a good fraction of my power into the ground, I'm flying mid-air. A second later I grab the railing and put my feet on it, instead of walking on the narrow corridor. Taking off in a near sprint, I'm halfway through the hundred-meter-long free path ahead when a spike of indignation gets to me through the ether. A few seconds later, I take a turn left, but there are no walking paths outside the buildings, so I simply jump to the nearest window, crab walking their sills. A calming thrum of glee and panic keeps coming. Any lingering doubt about the source is gone, and the chase is on as I purposefully avoid looking back knowing that that might end the game then and there. Gawking faces follow me though not nearly as many as if this had been before the system altered our paths. It's the reality of the situation and if I was giving in to the impulse now, so much more was the standard for hundreds, thousands of impatient teenagers and busy thoroughfares. We have the closest thing to superpowers that we could expect and the joy of using them. But right now I have a more important game to win. Half my mind tries to regain a little of my aura, control a skill I practiced long and hard before the system, and that it would be useful to expand upon. 
I tried to turn on that same perception filter that made people ignore me when I worked late in the night, even sometimes under the very noses of the forest guards responsible for Pando. Containing the level of strength and balance I exhibit is not something many can replicate, even if they are very selective in the stats they concentrate on. I can feel a hint of another skill I should have acquired long ago, but never managed to unlock. A type of movement skill beyond running. Possibly the very acrobatic skill I so wanted. But even though I don't want to lose the thread of the chase, I let my own streams of ether capture this moment of inspiration and insight. The flow drags pieces of the moment into it, infusing the pure ether to enhance the effect of the moment. The mildest state of enlightenment overcomes me, and I can not only feel the skill in my grasp, but so much more. This is a precious moment that pure ether helped me to attain, but I was fast running out of that. I twist my willpower mid-air once, twice, thrice in each one of my jumps, trying to cross that last little leg. My jumps grow longer, even while more of my attention tries to reduce my my aura to go unnoticed by the world. My legs push the ground, and walls with enough power to to lift trucks. Longer and longer arches become a synonym of my search for the pinnacle. The search for the spark that will help me cross this small gulf. More than just the right state of mind, but the state of body and of action. Then it comes. The system's reluctance gives way, and an ether construct comes into existence far away. A skill arrives on the way to my soul. Without a care in the world for my jump, I activate a floating rune with a constant stream of mana and tap the brakes that will reduce my momentum automatically. Though with only moments before I get to the wall the mild breaking power of the formation I'm using won't do much to slow me down. I don't even care that I might collide with a sharp object, only an unsheathed and masterfully crafted sword strongly held in place at the perfect angle even has a chance to injure me with how tough my skin is. In a split second, I enter my soul to witness the skill entrenchment process. It seemed ether constructs were common to me. But usually, it's only a small shift or addition in the form of a stat point or a normal skill level. This reaches another tier. The skill that comes is a lot less refined than my last two. Even if the acrobatics-like skills are very useful, it doesn't have that same all-encompassing flair changing each and every aspect of my being, like the dual mind skill. This is simply an extension of my physical movement capability on more occasions rather than just running. I get further in tune with the songs of ether that the system puts up, but all too soon it's over. Like listening to the greatest of symphonies for 30 seconds flat, and then it's over. Opening my eyes, I see the room's ceiling. I get up, rolling my shoulders out of habit, but this isn't combat, and it wasn't a several-ton wolf that fell on top of me during one of our sparing sessions, just hitting the ground with my own momentum. I then look to the side, and I grow self-conscious realizing where I am. A young couple lays in bed, with a startled young man holding an unsheathed sword. My face heats up even if what is in display is way less than what I captured from thousands of people every time I extended my perception field inside a city or near a concentration of people. Still, I look away turning to leave as quickly as possible, but the dumbstruck face of a young teenager in the window halts my exit. The calm demeanor of the situation, all things considered, is shattered as the young woman realizes that I'm not the only person who crashed the party and angry shouting ensues. I take off running for the window, forcefully breaking the moment. That takes the kid out of his days, throwing a few silver coins on the ground in the way of an apology for the broken window. I fly out. The broken window is the only thing I can remedy. That fraction of a second is enough for the kid to get to another window and I only catch a glimpse of his sand-colored cloak which blends fairly well with the predominant stone surroundings. I chase after that open window, one without any illumination and likely anyone inside. I dash inside hoping to catch him, but he is already leaving through the bathroom window. I keep up the chase without caring for the niceties, though I still don't use the perception field, relying only on my other senses. At times, he almost forces me to take a wrong turn. But in the end, my hearing, the vibration on the ground and air, and the distorted reflections I catch with my eyes are enough. I keep up my rhythm easily as his panting grows and grows until he can go no longer, and the chase is over in a random rooftop. I grab the scrawny little kid by the neck gently as sweat builds in between my fingers, just from that contact, and raise him to my eye level. Let me go. 
I'm not gonna run. You caught me fair and square. His nearly perfect usage of English doesn't surprise me. What does is a close look at his face, a face I recognize. You are touched in the head? What? No, I'm not mentally challenged. You aren't making sense. I mean, you visited Pando and met me? Yeah, if you were the magic man. But you are different. All well kept and groomed, talking to the world leaders at your whim. Not the crotchety old men touching kids' foreheads and giving them magical powers. I didn't give you powers, only a hint of ether. The rest was your doing. Same difference. Life stuff is half the reason I managed to do so well. I saw it. Impressive. And all of that at level 100. Yeah, my class is strange. I'm trying to take the next step. Wait. You aren't even sweating. You must have cheated. I'm not slow. With a simple smile, I reach out across space, without using a hint of chi to all the plants on the rooftop terrace and make them more vibrant. I enhance the vibrations of life, accelerating the extraction of vitality from the soil they are planted in. The terrace garden grows more luscious and greener. It won't be able to sustain that long without care, but it won't hurt them unless I push the effect to unnatural levels. Slowly a few grape vines slither their way and creep up to the starry-eyed kid. No, I didn't cheat. Though I could have in a thousand different ways. I say slowly wrapping a vine around his ankle which he easily sidesteps. I could have dodged that. He says demonstrating exactly that with ample room. I simply smile and this time I use my chi. I send two spheres, ready to pop with a spark of life. But I don't waste the second resource, instead choosing to use another technique. With a push and a lot more willpower than I wish the chi bubbles. Pop by the pressure applied and an explosion of growth springs the vines forward surrounding both his legs in an instant. Escaping by twisting motions that didn't sever the vines is impossible. He looks dumbfounded for a moment, but then grins sheepishly. Well, you are the magic man, protector of Pando and whatever. I can't even get mad I lost da. So, do you want me to touch your forehead again? Hum. He says thinking over my offer. Well, the first time turned out all right, so why not? Just don't tell my parents. He says with a serious tone and I nod in acquiescence, though I do need to needle him a bit. I thought I was supposed to be the one talking about silence. You are weird. You are gonna get us both in trouble if you keep that up. I approach him, having stopped restraining my perception field since I caught him. I learn everything I could hope to without direct access to his system screen or more time. I get fairly precise measurements for all his stats and even a few of his skills by the way he moves. His use of mana and movement techniques indicates a level of control I hadn't expected with such low mental stats, comparatively speaking. I reach out to Pando instead of tapping into my own pure ether stores. The large pool of fairly uncontaminated ether Pando, accumulated from the free floating stuff around the planet, comes over to me and I send probably a fifth of the amount I got during integration into the boy. More than the amount of pure ether I have now. After a moment, I send a hint of absolutely pure ether into him, with a pinch of soul scruff. Let me see what you can do with it. Those are precious and limited resources, but he may achieve something interesting with them. That soul scruff probably won't manifest in the same way as my usual technique. An exercise in which I help teams of people to increase their stats in a similar way to myself, but there is potential there and curiosity drives me. I feel powerful. As he speaks I can almost feel partially unconscious use of ether, enhancing his mana techniques. He must have been low on his own supply. Only a minute pulse comes out before it all heads back into his pool. With a cheeky grin, his idle shuffling during our talk finally takes near the corner of the roof, and he takes off running once again. Each jump spins a mode of the ether I gave him supercharging his moves to unbelievable levels, all without feeling the impossible confidence and drunkenness of raw ether usage that most proper ether wielders fell to. Interesting. Not quite fully conscious control, but I didn't expect even a fraction of this, even with the nudge I gave him. He didn't have the decades that most people need to accumulate a natural ether field. Alex is gonna have a field day figuring out and replicating what the kid did. He is probably the only one with the right mentality to figure out what the kid did with conscious control of ether. Chapter 295 Ajax's POV Nice ass in that Nash character. I can finally feel life stuff flowing back in my veins after his gift. I should save it 
only using it when it's absolutely necessary and for training and when it is really fun. Well, with how full my belly is of this so-called ether is and how little I use by now to move around, I can probably splurge a little. He really is a nice asin, and if I ask nicely, he can probably give me more. Shrugging my shoulders after a particularly large jump, I slow my pace making sure that he isn't following me. Shuffling, sliding, and wild jumps are fun, but he can hear them. Damn sensitive ears. A minute later, I'm struck by a wave of disappointment. He didn't even try to follow, but he probably has a bunch of boring stuff to deal with. Stealthily climbing a six stories tall building, I look over to three southward queen's pyramids. With plenty of life stuff, I will have a much easier time sneaking in, but now isn't the time. I run through the guard schedule and look for the next window. Tomorrow morning during food delivery. Without this much life stuff, the small weakness I sensed wouldn't be enough, but now? Now I have a real shot. Skipping atop buildings, I come back home, see my parents, eat my dinner like a good little boy then prepare till the very last minute before laying in bed. After that, it takes me an hour to slow my racing heart down, but eventually, sleep takes me under for about three hours. I spring out of bed more alert than I ever felt before the integration. The system is probably the best thing that happened for my sleep, especially as my parents now only keep a loose track of my schedule. With hours to go, I get a quick breakfast but instead of waiting until it's go time, I already run as close as I can to the pyramid I chose. Now, I only have to observe and wait. Hours sitting still in the best cover, I found only a couple hours away feels nearly impossible, but somehow I hold myself back. Without Nash's life stuff gift, this would be impossible, but I shouldn't waste any. Too precious. I lay on the ground and start to weave a very subtle cloak with only the barest hints of life stuff to make sure I go by unnoticed, not only to their eyes, but also to their other senses and the magical sensors like the life detectors. Those have been hard to figure out how to fool, but with ozonones flowing through my veins, it's barely any work. Three servers with two large boxes in between each pair come to the gate just as I get within 30 meters. The guard's attention goes to the two large boxes. A single slip and they will know I'm here, but my movements are smooth. The precise shape and perspective of my background cover my illusion. Timing everything and accounting for all the observation angles, I go behind a guard's back and get in position to enter the corridor. Mana-coated hands, with a secondary cloak of life stuff, make that effort relatively easy. Even the best mages can't feel small spells when I correctly shield them. I pass inside just as the shield opens. One of the guards is startled for a moment and I freeze, holding absolutely still as he takes a close look at a readout. Probably the life detector. I didn't know they had made them even more sensitive, but it's fine. I only need patience. They won't get a second warning. With my heart thumping and blood rushing to my legs and arms, I wait absolutely still. They let out a wry smile for a moment and I fear the jig is up, but a moment later, I hear them speaking to each other. Nothing to worry about, just a small blip on the detector. Log that is a false positive? Yeah, Code Alpha Juliet. I feel something strange in the second guard's voice. Is that mirth? He seems to be holding back a chuckle. Never mind. No time to waste with idle curiosity. What will sate real curiosity is just ahead. I slither along the ceiling with mana grips keeping up all my stealth skills, though not the dumb system ones, painstakingly practiced ones that actually work. Getting back to the entrance before they are done is going to be troublesome if I want to explore the crypt. The shields close as the servers are allowed inside past the pair of guards, just outside blocking anything, even a tank's shot from entering the pyramid. The only wind comes through small selective openings and winding paths past the equipment around the door. I walk with knees and hands glued to the ceiling, in a much different manner to my former visits. Even my couple visits before the enemy attacked were only playful walking instead of full stealth mode. Most of the time nobody bothered me, not even the occasional guard trying to stop vandalism, but the system repaired anything done to the pyramids and so concern quickly faded away. Though the pyramids still look old similar to before integration, too many details are different. I move out of the corridor even before the servers. The ceiling arches upward but I observe everything that I could possibly want from my vantage point. I climb to the very top before hanging my feet. The blood rushes my head, but it feels nice so I stay in the position for a few seconds. 
Then I turn around and feel something strange in the air that, unlike my last visit, over a month before the attack, the impression of life stuff overwhelms the air. No, not actual life stuff, but just its impression. The same impression I feel from the system screens when I'm paying attention. As I shift my feet and hand around and it's gone. My mind halts. Secrets, secrets, secrets. This is why I came over here. Shifting my feet and hands around I find that I need to touch the very center of the chamber before that impression comes back. But that isn't enough to unlock it. I watch as people get their food and I realize time is running out. I have to make my own luck. Shooting a hint of mana cloaked in life stuff down. I flip over a shelf of equipment that nobody was looking at and drop from the ceiling to the tomb in the cramped quarters. My mind struggles to keep a convincing illusion around myself. But I get what I need as that feeling gets stronger to the point a system screen pops up. A force grips me as the words of warning expel my own magic, fully revealing my visage to the others. But a moment later I'm no longer in that tiny little space. I'm seemingly in an infinite void with a much larger screen. You meet the parameters to unlock a legacy class. Error. System user already has class. Do you wish to switch your class from A and asterisk MT hashtag 2? Legendary, to Speaker of the Dead, Mythic, Locked Rarity. I stand in a strange space, dazed and with a foggy mind like I had just woken up after a long night with a smartphone under my bed covers and bloodshot eyes. I try to clear it and most of it fades, but some is still there. A blanketing messing with my memories, but there doesn't seem to be anything I can't remember. The void gives way to the dead forest, but as I try to walk past the system screen, my strange ghostly body is repulsed. Meters from the closest tree. I can't feel its bark. There isn't a single leaf is in its canopy and the entire field is full of dead trees like that. I follow the edge of this barrier all the way around learning it's not even a full two meters wide. The system screen follows me through it all, consuming a portion of my vision. I won't be able to explore unless I agree. That is no fair. This probably is a step in the right direction of unlocking the pyramid, but giving up my class for something completely unknown? Sure it looked strong, but I get in enough trouble as it is. I don't want to speak to the dead. All kinds of weird people will want to talk to their grammas and stuff. Sure my class is all jumbled up and I don't even know what it is supposed to do, but I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. It is my class and it has helped me to get to where I am now. Are you certain of your choice? With intent, I tap the only option I could choose. Confirm. Somebody else could use this CLA. The blanketing on my mind comes back with a vengeance. What was I doing? I looked around the central chamber in the pyramid, instinctively reactivating my stealth skills, but by absolute and unmitigated luck nobody was looking in my direction. Their gazes are either on the red alarm light that must have just lit up or taking care of their job. Shit, I was detected. With barely concealed moves I prepare to rush out. Any scout could spot if they were looking directly at me, so I flow way more life stuff than normal to keep the second layer of my illusion. I try to feel for the change in the ether, but the potential for a system screen is gone. Jumping up to the ceiling from the sarcophagus I look for the impression on the ceiling, but it's back to normal stone, not some weird system interface. Disappointment. The slightest of nuggets unlocks in my mind. A thread that if I follow will lead me back to what I was thinking. But I'm too flustered and as I run to the exit I sense a memory on the tip of my brain. Ready to come to the surface. But it's clouded by something and then is completely and utterly gone. My actions come into focus. If I don't keep myself on track, I will get caught and I don't want that. Everything fades away. I finally achieve my goal. Sure in the absolutely easiest of all the pyramids. The one with the most holes in its defenses and nearest to cover, but still a successful infiltration. A mixture and triumph and exhaustion hit me as I rush out. Knowing where is the most sensitive sensor, I pay particular attention just as the guards look inside. There are dozens of other pyramids to explore. I just need to not get caught. I tap the little log box I engrave myself. It precisely measures how good my stealth is and the distortion I induce in the environment. That's the information I need to improve. Now, I just need to time my exit with the guard's entry. Too bad I can't hear a single word from their mouth. Still, in back of my mind, I spin and spin trying to remember something, but I'm a hamster running on a wheel. 
No matter how fast I go, I'm standing still. Equals 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 equals. Pyramid Guards POV. Really sloppy, and he had such a good start. It has been a while since he made such a good starting attempt. Time to enter and lock before he rushes out. He had his fun already. Yeah, he screwed up big time. I never seen him do that. Even the best of us screws up sometimes. Entering quickly and reactivating the shield less than a second later we start a search, even asking for help from a couple of the researchers, mages, and the servers inside to no avail. Ten minutes later after going over each and every single cubic inch of the space systematically we find nothing. Pulsing life detectors and sudden changes of movements leave no room for him to escape. But Ajax isn't in the pyramid. His dad is gonna be pissed. We detect him entering supposedly secure facilities and we can't locate him afterward? Should we log it as an actual false positive? Nah, the blimp in the central chamber was clear. It's his life signature. They aren't very precise. The first sensor was like 5 centimeters from him. That is plenty of precision, and the second took a full picture. We do need to step up our game. If the enemy managed to pull something similar, we are screwed. Chapter 296 An impasse forms over the next month. Try as we might, the enemy is entrenched and nothing short of a war crime would get us inside. Under different circumstances, we might even consider such extreme measures if the cost was extracted only from the enemy or if the concrete danger they pose went beyond an eyesore and the need for a constant watch. The few voices that tried to drum up support quickly lost steam with my steadfast position against any such attempt as long as the cost was in the dozens of people every second for an assault that would at the minimum last hours. Maybe even days of constant pressure. I could be wrong, but it seems we have little to lose from leaving the enemy have this foothold except for tying up resources to nip any attempt they make to leave the pyramid. If they had multiple strongholds and a head start the situation might be different, but as long as the corridors limited the number they could bring out at a time, or they somehow cleared hundreds of thousands of soldiers stationed full-time and flattened the defenses they couldn't even use it as a slow way to transport their troops near our city. Cutting off this hypothetical line doesn't seem worth sending our best and brightest to their certain death. Developing better counters, improving assault methods, and upgrading our equipment is the only hope. I pit myself against the enemy attempting to crack at least a portion of the code. But best as I can work it out, even if I put forward my most extreme level of power and manage to sustain it for hours or even days that such an assault would require, I can only cover one corridor. Maybe with Alex's help and a generous mithril supply, I could do something, but the risk of losing that much of such a precious metal in any assault attempt sends shivers down my spine. Even if the most recent supply and info dump came with a little mithril, but the danger didn't come from our loss but the enemies gain. A pound of mithril in the elves' or goblins' hands would be disastrous. The enemy is already a genuine threat with barely any gold at hand, and I hadn't seen a single instance of them using mithril. Even the ones in the instance had more access to it. I run through the most optimistic math in a sanity check, attempting to gauge the cost of assaulting all three corridors with our full power simultaneously. Time. The rate of advancement and the best equipment we had without encountering any meaningful surprises. Under such conditions, our losses would be at the very least in the 50 to 100,000 range. Teams after teams burned in instance, and any gain we made between attacks was lost as the vanguard of our assault was disintegrated by the system powered defenses. There is nobody else but me who could take the full powered attacks without dying in a single shot in such cramped quarters. Even the best team supporting a single, overwhelmingly geared tank that would make fighting so cumbersome, it might as well be impossible wouldn't survive more than a few attacks. Even applying constant pressure on the outer shield isn't feasible as things stand. Without my presence, it's too dangerous for the mages involved. The equipment needed to be within a couple of meters, even if we didn't care for efficiency there is the mana disruption of the pyramid to consider. Ranged attacks simply split into their base components when traveling. All that coalesces in my mind in a complex, unsolvable puzzle. I had done foolhardy things in the past, but any time I even think of assaulting it head-on, a hint of dread flows out from my gut warning me of the danger. The smaller pyramid, especially just after they had taken over, was just within my range. Here they have many more people. Time to improve the defenses, 
what might as well be endless mana in the pyramid's battery and much stronger defenses to make use of that mana. If I had gotten greedy and assaulted the larger pyramid straight away, we might have caught them by surprise enough to gain some ground, but it wouldn't last long enough. I doubt that luck would continue for the entire trip with twice as many people per meter fighting me. My mind turns to something closer at hand that I can affect. My class trial. The 10-month countdown is over. Leaving Earth to defend itself rankles on me, especially given that I can't expect more than a fraction of the upgrade this time around compared to breaking through to level 100. The whole endeavor almost doesn't seem worth the effort. Not being here to prevent a disaster while attempting to grow strong enough to enact my will on the world and acquire the power to protect it. Right now, there is a small chance that something of the sort may occur, but as far as I can tell, it will simply increase my stats a little bit along with adding yet another skill to my repertoire, as long as my plan to upgrade my main class succeeds. A new awesome skill is probably the closest that I can hope for to a fundamental increase in power. But even as I want to rage against everything and curse the world for not giving me the power I need to protect humanity, I also know that easy power boosts are mirages. I can only trust what has a visible cost to acquire as I learn its intricacies and slowly develop. I page one of my journals in the little hut I erected on the edge of Giza. The real estate was a relatively cheap piece of land to which they graded a relative level of diplomatic immunity. Nothing convoluted, but they promised the plot of land for the next century which now with system seems such a short time frame. But that's way longer than most natives can even dream of holding out against the invaders. Skimming single lines entries, most of which deep down I will never get to at the current pace, especially given I simply add to the list which isn't meant as the real one. That only gets entries I have pondered over while this is closer to a long-term brainstorming session. It isn't quite at the level of a corporate-induced one with shameless people actually saying what comes to their mind, but it isn't too far with only the loosest layer of filtering. A few minutes later I get to the last page, without any insights or new nuggets that can drag another of those ideas to the forefront. Only the priority list remains, and as I look at it, I know that it's missing something, but I don't know what that may be. So I just keep going trying to find the next steps on the path. Hopefully, these are all roughly in the right direction. Until eventually, I get a glimpse of my true desire. The sun angles further and further down, telling me that one of the few gatherings I was expected to show up to approaches. Nothing that will take ages, nor that will create a precedent that every person with the barest amount of authority could expect me to attend their parties. This dinner is mostly a formality in deepening our relations and finalizing our treaty. We couldn't simply remain here forever, and writing down our intentions and parameters for our cooperation just sounds prudent. We brought a huge number of elites over hundreds of thousands of kilometers from home. Delaying their return could only be justified if we were aiming to recapture the pyramid in short order. Even staying to protect the other pyramids isn't an excuse. They are as reinforced as we could make them and secured against all known threats. Each one had a pocket of space tied to it, and there was even a seed who volunteered to inhabit the second largest structure over here, the Pyramid of Koffer. Just with its attention alone, they would be able to operate all the faux inner worlds. If the enemy ever actually takes another pyramid, they are going to have a nice surprise in coming from the central chamber. Thousands of troops housed in relative comfort that wouldn't even require pandos or another seed's attention. I had grown wood defenses and even added small stores of biomass to be used as fuel if they were cut off from the outside. That on top of days engraving even the smallest of roots in the pyramids with stories of freedom makes them absurdly resilient to system encroachment. They also act as a secondary backbone helping to power the rune's hand engraved with tremendous precision on the metal plates. From that made up the bulk of the defenses. We would be hard-pressed not to lose any more ground with those entrenchments, and a few hundred thousand elites likely wouldn't meaningfully change the conflict if the enemy pulled something else from their hat. All that doesn't even consider the small portion of allied elite troops who would remain behind after we signed a treaty. Even from the other side of the world, my help would grow with how much nature has grown directly from Pando was their city and around it. It's time to come back to our own village. We didn't even have the excuse that coming over here for support would take so long it would be useless. Transportation has once again changed. The relatively slow speeds of my flying buses are still the same, but 
But I continued to expand their size, and now there are rockets. Only a limited number of people would ride them for now. But even with relatively basic designs, we can just focus on large-scale fuel processing plants. This way I won't even have to deal with the people that needed it pissed at me for taking it all without a warning during an emergency. The hours pass with me slowly making my way through both the daily progressions and new ideas I had. The sun starts to disappear behind a nearby building. Usually, I would simply keep working in the inner world as my other half took control of our body, but this time the weight in the air pulls my attention as he is the one that stays experimenting. I walk out through the window, and with expert control of my chi float mid-air towards the center of the city. I rely less on the root formations inside my body and more on my own ability to directly hold the runes in the air with enough precision that putting weight and moving doesn't warp it into uselessness. Mimicking an air walk with timed pulses of propulsion and tiny air distortion on each of my steps ends up being a really fun exercise. I hypnotize myself into action and climb from a couple of meters to roughly 20 by phasing the levitating part of the exercise into one of my inner world pockets. It is plenty for my purposes. Timing my steps with the humble pulsing acceleration and deceleration of the propulsion spell reveals imperfections all throughout the process. Even allowing a decent margin of error, I'm limited to a normal walking pace to be anywhere near convincing. Maybe if I was imitating an octogenarian, I could match the acceleration profiles to my standards, but at a normal walking pace, even a pre-system user could probably tell I'm not actually airwalking. This exercise is probably one of the least efficient ways of moving around. That realization strikes me deeply, and as a counterbalance, I start practicing a rarely focused skill, something the best mages all practiced and filled whole sections of Merlin's missives. Real mana economy. Not the one I already understood and laid in many ways at the center of. Transporting mana from one city to another for a small fee with the help of the root network, which is fast becoming part of the new substructure of our reality as important, if not more so than the internet backbone before all this began. No, this mana economy is closer to the old miles per gallon standard. How much work I can produce per unit of mana. This is a metric that will indicate the increasing the differences between the average Joe occasionally flisking off a flame to start a fire versus a talented and well-trained mage. The mechanisms behind it are similar to how I use my will to make my spells more effective and less prone to simply disintegrating before the gray energy of the HLZ beasts and other enemies. But there is another dimension to using willpower to back a spell. Mana isn't supposed to be simply thrown around by truckloads as we lazily go used to do, but to be carefully dolled out. My inner world is an amazing tool, but constant access to infinite mana instilled bad habits in me so it's time to overcome them. Pulling straight from my own pool, I feel the connection of my chi and cycle it through the best raw gem I found, set in the formation at my back. Perhaps half of the amount of resource I would usually wield for this, but as the runic formation I'm manually keeping in the inner world sucks in the resource and uses it all in an instant, I try to phase and restrict that usage to only what actually makes a difference, reinforcing my willpower around it. It comes sluggishly, especially on a spell with ten times more runes than most mages could handle. These formations are intended to be engraved on solid matter, not power system user spells. The propulsion I expect comes, slightly weaker than normal. But what I pay attention to are the specific effects. The spell sucks in the mana, like it's pulling from a porous stone covering it. Starved from this resource, instead of being bathing it causes it to lose potency, but the way the mana consumption plummets makes it way more efficient. 91% effectiveness against 54% chi consumption. Probably one of my best results ever, though not that impressive compared to other mages, who without infinite mana at their fingertips with the inner world had to scrape by in a similar fashion since day one. After a fairly long training session, I approached the building. Aiming for a window in the two-story mansion, I was directed to I stop my air walk, simply gliding forward. A hint of chi nudges the window pane to the side, almost touching the flowers on the balcony and freeing up space for me to enter in a single fluid motion. Shock graces the cafes of half the guests while the other shrugs at my antics in the age of the system. The one whose house I just entered cuts his words in half, catching me from the corner of his eye and spins in my direction in a sharp turn. Hidden storms fill his face and he takes a step in my direction. Aya, oh never mind. 
His stormy expression instantly morphs into a flustered expression. But to his credit, he keeps his composure. He was just about to scold me for some reason. That thought nearly sent me laughing on the ground. Then the moment is broken and both our heads turn back at a scuffling sound completing the picture. A child comes tumbling through another window. This one much more noisily than me without flight magic, but elegant to a fault for a scrappy boy. What calls my attention to this moment, however, is that a misty's approach. I have the bloody perception field, and I missed it. The vague notion in my mind of what his intent had been morphed into certainty as I realized exactly what had been on our host's mind. Oh, you thought I was your kid. That's why you wanted to scold me. Chapter 297 I stare at Ajax, while his father mildly scolds him. Though their hushed words aren't all that there is. Much more is communicated in inferences. If I don't miss my guess, he is probably 14. But there is a well of youthful exuberance to him that would make me put him way lower if I hadn't met him before the system in Pando. Even with his back turned to me and addressing Ajax, I can almost taste his father's exasperation at my actions. I'm way older and am still pulling the same kind of prank. I look within Ajax's body, trying to determine if there is anything more on why he looks so young. But I don't notice anything beyond the normal variability, so I don't pursue it further. Just one from the thousands of small curiosities never to be answered. Where were you? His father asks, and the instant response in Ajax's brain is what draws my attention. I sense the cut connections as he tries to remember. Thousands of pathways leading to a blank zone. Incomplete mental circuits very precisely sniped. Inhumanly precise. Something that without context I wouldn't even have noticed even with the perception field actively going through someone else's brain. But I had seen this particular type of system shenanigans before. And he doesn't have just one scar, but several almost atop each other. Erasures targeting something very similar that happened over time. I take a step, flicking my ankle with a pulse of life, and while Chi glued that foot to the stone floor, I push so hard that it almost breaks. Anyone without the system would only see a blur teleporting the 17.2 feet from my starting position to Ajax. But I don't even feel the distaste about using a few points of life right now. There are more important things. Touching Ajax's forehead, and as we lock eyes I can see a hint of pain there. Pain that I know needs to be drawn out. Yes, exuberant youthful energy, but also something missing. You can see? His entire demeanor changes as he realizes I'm not there to scold him like his dad. Tears pop on his tiny eyes, and I grow self-conscious, even if I know that I'm not the cause. I'm actually his best shot at uncovering clues about what the system erased. Arrogant as my assumptions may be, I push forward. What are you doing? His dad asks, forcefully putting his hands on my shoulder. But with Chi gluing my feet to the ground, he might as well be trying to move a locomotive with his bare hands. Something possible for someone with high enough stats, but I barely pay any attention. The mingling people stop to witness what I'm doing, and the atmosphere grows uncomfortable. I look at his dad and then back at Ajax. You lost six memories. I six, are you sure? I tried to remember, but I can't, he spouts. Yes, there are six scars likely caused by the system erasing your memory. He gets a little of his composure back. A hint of real understanding about the mental confusion the system had been causing. The chaos induced in his mind. I was afraid of that. That is how many new pyramids I poked in the last month. It's good to know for sure. His dad startles at that, and given the tight security I helped to get in place I understand that reaction. But even if his dad is partially lost in our conversation, he manages to catch the train mid-trip and he knows I'm not there to make things worse. My mind turns over the problem every which way, but we can't do anything right here. Well, the system does tend to poke its head where it doesn't belong. I guess I can probably stay another couple of days to help you figure this out. But the damage is gonna get worse if you just keep doing this the exact same way. Abajalitely not. His dad tries to put an end to any discussion, but I put on everything I learn and I say, Do you really want to deny him that? The chance to learn what is missing? He wouldn't be completely safe even if you wrapped him in bubble wrap and stuck him in your cellar. We have a chance to figure out what the system did and why, so why not take the time to do that? He tries to refute my words, words that only a few other people understand as nobody is translating them from English, but words he recognizes the truth of. 
Ajax's dad forcefully breathes out, letting as much of the tension fade as possible, before nodding. Tomorrow, now, we have other business to attend to. I think of forcing the issue, but that won't help especially given that I have to think over what is the best way to figure out what has happened and to prepare. The entire time I spend at the dinner, the discussions, movement, and interactions hum in the background of my mind. Maybe there are interesting people to talk to in here, and maybe I could have added the finishing touches to the treaty, but something else calls my attention. The night ends with no further surprises, and I head straight to the pyramids, entering each of them and going through the sensor locks. I find three occasions that must have been the points Alex crossed one of the more sensitive life detectors. In the second one, he seemingly lost all control and let a full life signature be captured in the central chamber. Though sneaking in on the pyramids is generally easier than slipping my notice with the perception field in place, even if I wasn't actually paying attention. A mild redesign of the shields and runic workings comes to the forefront of my mind to stop anyone from trying a similar strategy. Not actually trying to rain on Ajax's parade, but if he could do it, who said the enemy couldn't replicate the feat, if not do worse. There should never have been a single second that the shield is never fully open. There had been some pushback given the practicality of simpler designs, and I actually settled for single-layer shields, but better safe than sorry. With a multi-layer design that can protect the guards outside and be overwritten at any time in either emergencies or the occasional large supply dump, we shouldn't wait for someone to break security before trying to address the problem. We should focus on coming up with even harder ways to secure the pyramids. In between each of the sections, another thin shield will also physically check if anyone is accompanying the people making their way inside and last, but not least I need to add a more sensitive detector even if this one will have atrocious range. Just another dozen tasks before I head back home. I go up and down, rifling through everything on all the pyramids we had access to, but learn nothing new about his situation or how to unlock the pyramids. This is what the system must have erased. The night advances and eventually, I head back to sleep miffed, but with enough concrete ideas to test tomorrow. After a couple of hours recovering in a deep sleep, I rise before the sun in minutes after get to the pyramid. A quick scan reveals Ajax and his dad making their way through the city. Even though they are kilometers away, I have portals available and this isn't the enemy's territory. So I open one large enough for both and invite them to the pyramid I'm in. The kilometer's long jog instantly turns into a one-second trip through the inner world and they are standing beside me. Handy, says the dad. Yes, too bad I can't travel through my own portals. So even more ways you could have cheated, Ajax says and I just grin. More ways than you could dream of. Now let's get started. Yeah, but I already came in this pyramid. I doubt it will happen again on the same pyramid. I glance down at a runic contraption on his belt. You have logs? Yeah, but they are only useful to record how good my stealth is. Still worthy data. After the first major slip, I managed to keep a minimum stealth level running without my full attention. Yeah, I caught that. You were in plain view in one of the pyramids. The alarm wasn't raised because people knew it was you. That is what I learned. He says subtly side-eyeing his father. So, the Middle Queen's Pyramid? Sounds good. I haven't cracked how to enter it yet. The security is too tight. Go through the portal and I will meet you on the other side. Without waiting for him to say anything while I directly interface with the shield and drop it just in time for me not to ram it. I twist around pulling my propulsion rune into overdrive while pumping steam out at unbelievable rates. Accelerating near the speed of sound in a second and then coming down to a running pace on the end doesn't even strain my soul given the relatively low speeds though if I cross into the supersonic, the strain would get to me even at much milder accelerations. Barely six seconds later, I'm in the other central chamber, but Ajax is lounging as if he had long gotten there, even though I saw his trip with the perception field. Oh, took you long enough, says Ajax. His dad almost scolds him, but I just wave it off. That's pretty lazy. The obvious joke and all. I know, but it had to be done. The classics never die. Now on to the important stuff, I say in a more serious tone. What did you do when you get inside the pyramid? Usually, I just look around. Do that again. Better yet, pretend you were sneaking in. Um, I can almost see his mind turning the problem. He doesn't want to give up his secrets, but considering how good his stealth is, 
His father probably won't even learn the specifics. I simply nod at him, and he fades from view, even becoming more intangible with my perception fully trained on him. He moves to the corridor, and I don't give any indication I noticed what he did. With incredible precision shielding the visible range, his life signature, and even the mana he spins, he climbs on the walls and ceiling, looking around and tapping the shelves against the wall and runic devices we put there. Both mana and ether meld in a thin coat, formed through mechanisms I don't understand. It almost seems like almost phases out of reality. But the perception field still captures a tangibility to him. So I can touch him, and any attacks would scorch his skin just the same. Partially it resembles a proper, high-level stealth skill from the system melded with personal capabilities. It even reminds me of my perception filter stealth, which caused people's eyes to overlook my presence, which didn't take even a hint of mana or chi. After a minute, the effect of his stealth grows way less effective on me, and I follow him in my mind's eye without even needing my active attention. Though like a thousand other things, I have no stinking clue how to replicate it. After a minute, he climbs on top of the dome, right above the sarcophagus, and that's when I sense a shift in the air. There is potential here, like a system screen or something. His voice echoes from the walls in an indeterminate direction, but I ignore his dad's reaction while trying to find his location. I simply stare at him, Alex, through his stealth, trying to directly feel the change. After years of practice, I could feel the tiniest hints of ether from visible screens, but his powers manifested differently than mine, significantly differently. Try to increase the potential you feel, but don't activate the screen. Okay, I can try. He moves around for a minute, before dropping to the sarcophagus and finding the path to greater potential. Like he turned up the gain on the microphone. The inaudible buzz in the background grows into something I can hear and feel, and if only I reach out I will get it. But the system rejects me. It's clear, this isn't for me. My mind keeps driving faster and faster, as I gather my will and push to bridge that gap even if only in the perception field. More. Ajax approaches it ever so slightly, that potential comes closer to our reality, but it isn't enough. This clearly isn't meant for me and I can't even get close without interfering, but I push as I had so often done in the past, trying to cheat the system. More. 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 Each time I can almost sense a flinch from Ajax. He hadn't hesitated before, but now that he knows what is erasing parts of his mind, he is afraid. But the pursuit of knowledge and my curiosity are too strong, and I command once more. More. As he moves, he trembles a few millimeters too far, and crosses the threshold I have been pushing him to approach. The system descends around him. A target infusion, so brief and well delineated. It is all but impossible to notice. But I'm no normal person. The perception field and my sky-high perception stat well, over a thousand make, that endeavor seem like it happens in slow motion. His perception is distorted. For that split second, it's as if time passes slower. And for the first time, I feel the swirls of time mixed with space as the system as it teleported someone. It's subtle, and this is the very reason I feel as if I'm instantly teleported when the system takes me. But my will covers the environment, and I'm not going to just let it happen without doing anything. As everything that I'm and can achieve goes against the system, I realize how arrogant I have been. I can do nothing to protect him. I don't have even the mild, home ground advantage of working around my own body or the large boost that allowed me to stop anything that affected myself. Nor is this one of the mild or even average operations of the system. The system won't be denied. Its response is to simply keep going, increasing pressure ever so slightly to compensate for all my power. I'm like a kid trying to hold back a container ship taking away every single one of my toys, the contents of my house, and even the house itself. But my bare hands and the random piece of cotton twine aren't enough to hold back a ship. Seeing him turning fully intangible as the system teleports him, I try to touch his forehead once more and do the only thing that might have any effect on the following proceedings. A hint of my prized pure ether and a few more flakes of soul scruff enter his soul. It has to be enough. A severing of connection and a decent portion of my finger skin is gone, but I don't let it bother me. Instead, I wait and prepare for his return. Chapter 298. Shivers travel up and down my spine in conflicting waves. 
I don't want to lose my memory again. I almost give in and start crying, but this time is different. I at least know the source of madness. It isn't coming out of nowhere. It's the system's doing. I purposefully don't even look at the system screen for a moment, composing myself and taking the situation. Coming here wasn't in my plan for now, not after learning each time I came left me with a scar in my mind and lost memories. This dark forest really isn't a pleasant place. I try to walk out in my ghostly body, but I'm limited to a small circle, barely wide enough to extend my arms out. The system screen reads pretty simply. You meet the parameters to unlock a legacy class. Error. System user already has a class. Do you wish to switch your class from A and asterisk MT hashtag 2, legendary, to speaker of the dead? Mythic, locked rarity. Yes, no. Absolutely. New OT yet. Just thinking no may take me out of here. And there is a pretty compelling reason to remain here least for a minute. The system is going to erase my memory as soon as I leave. I have my own life stuff and whatever Nash gave to me in the last second. But as I try to summon it into this plane, I fail. For that matter, summoning anything including mana doesn't just seem far away. It seems at an infinite distance. Over here only my own thoughts and body are under my control. I try to mark my ghostly skin, open other system screens, and do whatever comes to mind such as riding on the ground. And though that seems to create a slight effect, it's hard work that won't help in taking any information out. I can't even walk out of the tiny starting spot. I try to engrave this moment in my memory, even though I know what the system will do as soon as I reject its offer. Trying to stop it this way may only yield a worse result than letting go, but I can't simply give up. All that seems under my control are my emotions and my body. The first is only minimally useful, while the second is unlikely to work. Still over the next minute, I try to drive myself into the most excited state I can, but it simply doesn't come, at least not enough that it will take a while to fade. The only state I'm sure will work is one I don't want to experiment with. Fear. I already have enough just being here, but I simply let it build while adding fuel to the fire and watching my own anxiety explode. Doing the most ridiculous pose I can imagine just as an experiment, I tap the little and O button and then confirm my action. An invasion of my mind brings confusion and something else. Nash's POV. Ajax starts to be teleported back. He is not even fully back and I ignore his father's complaints as I open a portal just behind him ready to push him through into a prepared room. Life comes to my fingertips. The deep crimson resource, more concentrated than health rushes into his brain even while I feel the system's fingertips meddling. Normally I would be at worry of the system, but right this second seems like the end of the world. I shouldn't allow the memory wipe, and any thought that doesn't support my goal simply bounces off. I drive all my power and attention trying to undo the damage happening right in front of me. The system pushes, and I even feel something ever so slightly different this time, but the only thing letting me keep any semblance of equality is my momentum. The drive consumes my focus. Ajax fully enters the inner world, and I close the portal forcing the system to pass all the defenses in place. Runes carved all along the edges of the main inner world connect to a single room that is focused around a tiny pod. Each layer that its attention has to cross makes the system's efforts exponentially harder. I try to shift the mental frames of how the whole thing works even while the system drives inside relentlessly. Millions of carefully carved runes suck in hundreds of thousands of mana, hundreds of chi, and the willpower of seven rings of mages around Ajax, numbering in the thousands. Their entire will was out in the open, mages who didn't care for the system and wanted to deepen their knowledge of how to resist it. Opposing the system in small ways doesn't seem to open them up to hidden penalties as I was under in the instance. I try to imagine that the inner world is not outside of me, an independent pocket of space, but that it is housed within myself. My leverage to push the system grows ever so slowly, but like running just shy of a full sprint, even if don't yet feel the burn, it is only a matter of time, and soon I will be at my limit, as surely as gravity points downward. The attention of the machine is relentless. So relentless I have to wonder if it is going to be like, if it is for a few hours or forever. It really doesn't seem like the type of thing that it will give up after a couple of tries. Even if it doesn't go forever, I doubt that Ajax has the willpower to fully resist at such a young age to win a staring contest against the ruthless eye in the sky. 
and each moment I only get closer to my own limit, and soon my help will drop off. Still, as long as he is standing, I'm not willing to give up. The usefulness of my two minds comes to the forefront, as my other half is consumed with using our chi to empower the most critical parts of the runes balancing it all out to the delay the system. I put my mental imagery on the back burner, trying to telepathically reach the unresponsive Ajax. A permanent balance seems impossible, but maybe he could tell us something from inside before it's fully gone because I doubt he is going inside anytime soon. I flood his brain with life with tight control of my actions. Months of tinkering with seed brains hadn't really made me any kind of expert on the human brain, but life usage is mostly instinctive and it heals the neuron barriers the system tries to establish. While they happen, the change is trivial to see with the perception field, enhanced by Ajax being inside my inner world. In the pool of life, I weave tiny filaments of healing around his brain in a facsimile of what I imagine a fully-fledged mind healer would do. A fog in his mind I didn't realize was there lifts as a result of something I did, and the system's reaction is violent. I put my own will behind the defensive efforts empowering the gold-carved runes in Ajax's pot. The temporary room carved out against the system helping us now, as it can't overwhelm our efforts instantly. The damage gets through to me as the trashings of the system grow stronger, but it is fairly predictable, and while it marshals its strength and brings more of its attention over here we have a tiny window. We have seconds at most, and I won't waste it. Even before the words leave my mouth, the system presses begin to pile up its power around our barricades. Tell me everything. You arrived here fearful. His voice is croaky, but there is steel hidden underneath. Yes, but it felt fake, forced. Like I intentionally drove myself into a panic. I think this is the only way I figured out how to communicate from the other side. I simply added fuel to the situation. Fuel. That word is stuck in my mind. Keep going. I encourage him over his dad's protests, but he is outside the inner world and can't do much to interfere right now. Either way, not real horror just a passing state. If I was willing to undergo this process a couple dozen times, maybe I could spell a word or something. I need to think on it. My mind runs through it at supersonic speeds, powered by my perception stat and I ask the obvious. Where were you? I, I think a dark forest. I just have this image of dead nature and fog. What else? I don't think I was really there, only my ghost. I had a choice before me. I think I always chose against something, so the system kicks me out. A choice. A system prompt. I can't remember what it's about. I can't. I see the fragility of his state. The crumbling memory castle. Even the connections still there are wildly connecting to undamaged parts of his brain. Soon, anything I force out of his is going to be fabricated out of whole cloth. The system is muscling me out and taking even packing up the rubble so that I can't piece the original shape back together. He spins his own ether and mine in something akin to the natural patterns, but in a concentrated way, and only inside his own body. Something he told me is all he knows how to do. Then I ask one final question. Can you at least tell me if the system screen was a trial, something to do with a new territory, a quest? No, nothing like that. A class? I that, that sounds familiar. The crashing of the system is complete and even I tremble at the wave of power melting the gold and mithril runes in the closest layer to him. Near absolute control of the inner world, space lets me avoid the molten metal dripping on his vulnerable body and I sense a vindictive desire rise in me to one-up the efforts of the system. But feeding this dark desire is only gonna corrode my own will. I won't push Ajax towards another pyramid just to extract that little bit more information to satisfy my curiosity. And I won't lie and say that would be my main motivation if I let it run amok. After a moment of silence, I manage to hear what my gut has to say, which lines up with my logical interpretation of the situation. I won't learn much more without changing strategies and Ajax probably should be left to heal his own scars. The system would have a harder time erasing my memory but even I might not escape even if it only used something of this power. I can't take this burden from Ajax, he will have to find a way to bear it. I have done what I could given that finishing the mechanical aspect of healing is trivial. I fully relax as the last vestiges of the heavy pressure in the air fade. The system is constrained by its own rules. The machine, 
limiting itself because it was built with a relatively pure purpose. Without those limitations, it would be and now is turned against the very people it was supposed to nurture into greater power. But there are fundamental limitations. We aren't strong enough. Ajax's memory is purged and so I stop trying to heal him the same way. But as the system fades, newfound insights lead me to smooth over the oldest scars. Reconnecting the blank spots in his mind won't allow him to remember. Not when the memories hadn't even been something he stored in his long-term section through a night's sleep. At least that should help with the open cycle loops in his mind. That feels like something that would drive most people insane over the weeks or months. His own mind would have probably done something similar eventually, but the points of life I spend seem worth it right now. Life can't heal most sicknesses of the mind, but acute injuries like this it can. My mind spins, even as Ajax returns to the pyramid to his half-worried, half-pissed dad. I close this avenue in my mind. While useful, the danger of pushing Ajax for minimal gains completely turns me away from it. Not without a fundamental increase in my own, or his capability to fight the system, or an entirely different strategy. He will have to find his own way forward. Maybe a seed would be able to retain something, but he mentioned a ghostly body. So probably not. Ether constructs, a mnemonic memory palace, and even a variation of his emotion-driven state are possible options, but we know too little. A thousand ideas pass through my head, and all are discarded just as quickly as they arrive. This experiment is over, his dad says while holding Ajax tightly against his side in no uncertain terms. We both stop patting my clothes mid-action and look at him with similarly chiseled faces though wildly different heights and simply say in unison. Yeah, of course. I feel a hint of an untamed curiosity in the back of his voice, behind the lingering fear. Ajax won't be content to remain in the dark forever. Then he mutters, for now, so low only the vibrations of his own vocal cords are enough for me to discern his words, but I chose not to comment. At his insistence, I end up spending another half an hour trying to tease anything out of his memory without success and I look at the time more as a lesson to move him more towards some of the aspects of ether he hasn't experimented with. I end up learning more than I expected. Like my first impressions, I don't share enough of a mindset to imitate his use of ether just yet, but it's a skill I eventually work on. It sounds very useful and interesting. Anything I learn will probably help make my own development smoother. With one last look at the young boy with a determined face, I know that I have to say a few more words. It won't be today. It may be this year, or even this decade, but you know what you have to do one day? Yes, I know. It may not be fair. You are young, but it is your responsibility. Lay it to the side and get yourself back together, learn and grow because I have a feeling only you will be able to unlock them. I step out of the pyramid and manipulate Chi to take flight, phasing the effect from the inner world which doesn't limit me to a few meters, or even a few dozen meters, but kilometers of height. My mind can't let go. How to unlock the pyramid? Ajax poking stumbled upon the first clue, and he carries the torch, but we should do our due diligence and test. So, I outline a plan. Gather thousands of children both with and without classes for them to explore the pyramid. Maybe we will get lucky, but something tells me that Ajax is special. The system may want us to unlock the pyramid, but it hasn't stepped in to guide us in the right direction just yet. Still, through it all, my own trial and meddling system screen comes to mind. I will have to figure it out. The ten months of wait are over, and the next wave of enemy reinforcements won't come for nearly a month. This is the ideal time. Chapter 299 Second Archdruid's POV We need a cohesive plan. We can't branch out to become strong in all directions, we need specificity against these enemies. Our grandiose leader speaks, trying to drum up support. The enemy is too good defending against everything. An archdruid of relatively little import says, No, that's not quite correct. They have managed to achieve middling levels of skill with most things, and they generally quickly figure out counters to our assault. But there is one thing that they have shown themselves fairly inept at, and with the right plan we can achieve major victories in this manner. The group listens intently, and though it's nothing of grand proportions, he plays the crow well. What it is? One of his most steadfast supporters asks. Pinpoint precision attacks. Concentrated and intent on piercing their defenses to kill a select person, 
or even small groups. Hell, most of our kills come from attacks like that, but we need to drive this point home. I drop my head sinking into my hands. What? Do you have a comment? I realize the open invitation to challenge, but he hasn't chosen a fully adversarial position, so he isn't aiming for my head today. He is probably just using the opportunity to further discredit me while increasing the support for his plan. That's a small advantage we should hone and hoard until a critical juncture. If you use it too early, the enemy will learn to counter it. Simple as that. It's not quite so small an advantage, and it might be enough with a few other preparations for us to finally take over some of the enemy territory. Maybe not proper ether icons, but there are plenty of places we need. Using your own words against you, with how impressive the enemy is, they are going to improve on this weakness eventually. His words get more expansive until he is speaking to the whole room once again. So far, they only have good large-scale shields, grand workings of defense powered by tremendously powerful runes drinking more mana than every elf we have on this mud ball. But they simply throw mana and willpower at the problem. They haven't acquired the finesse that real magic demands, and we are starting to get the level of craftsmen required to produce what we need. With my preparations, we just need another month or two so we can get the tools to eliminate a decent portion of their strongest warriors, maybe even that cursed Nash, though that will likely require a much larger sacrifice. The way the crowd moved showed that not a single one was willing to concede my point in our new leader's presence. Most simply swallow his words whole, but when the alternative is to admit we are weak, it grows too hard. The meeting ends, and I walk away trying to put it all in perspective. I will have to step up my own efforts to protect my race from their stupidity, from politics past the point where different viewpoints add and sharpen each other. Instead, we walk into a dangerous realm where diminishing our elven opposition as the goal. I doubt they will appreciate my efforts even if I succeed. They have too much to lose if I'm proven correct. If I'm not careful or the circumstances are ambiguous, I might even get the blame. Entering my humble abode is a stark reminder of my new position. Humbler than even a few of the higher-level druids, though my demotion couldn't be too overt given I'm a fully-fledged archdruid. Still, glory and accolades are of little concern. Only my work developing contingencies is important. After sitting on a chair, I had to make myself otherwise I would be left without. I start my work. I mold a wooden disc with a tiny portion of another design of mine entirely done inside my own head, practicing for when I might need it. Gentle guiding touches made even the dead would change shape and I question why had I always been instructed we need to be more forceful with nature, to rule it with an iron fist and dominate it. Deep down, I know exactly why. To keep us on paths of destruction, even when it proves to be the inferior path. The goal of the empire is to expand. Others tended to arrive with honeyed words and contracts as restrictive as the system would allow. But elves couldn't abide that and given goblins were our fellow invaders this world was destined for a nice, comfortable place underneath our boots, probably with quite a few less alive than before integration. We might allow for more on occasion, but we always push for complete dominance if the natives don't bow before our majesty and rightful rule. I almost spit out given the absurdity of the propaganda I spoke every day for the last millennia. We are the Empire's frontline fighters, doing the bidding of the council, though I doubt even the Primarch has even met a direct council representatives let alone any of the council's actual members. The council's shadow is long and they don't want a single nugget of mithril that could be in their hands to escape. Nor the natural treasures, the prime hunting grounds and whatever else we can extract from a planet leaving us with the stew and bones and only the smell for the natives. My attention comes back to the piece in my hand. With ease I failed to achieve even at my full level. The runes came to me as my hands seemed almost guided by the pliable wood tablet in my hands. Strange symbols with meaning attached to them mold the wood just like the enemy could do on the fly, but the critical difference is that they aren't familiar with the runes I'm using. A nonsensical design meant to mislead until the very last second. I will only create the full version seconds before I need to use it. Right now, what I need is more practice. The lingering knowledge someone may be watching me even this close to the heart of our forces. I don't know how, why, or if it's really happening, but it would explain so much. I can only rely on my own mind as a safe place. Even that may not be fully safe, 
Not if the fools in charge decide I need to face a public trial. As I look at it, I realize I made a mistake in my design. It matches the blueprint I came up with, but it won't work very effectively. With a slight modification, I smooth out the mana pathways. That seems to balance everything once again. I just hope the final design won't be riddled with such problems. Shaping the small disc from its finished form back into a flat piece of wood completely eliminates any proof of my actions. Then I'm back to producing small formations to be placed around the city. Some I scrap judging they aren't up to my standard, only occasionally melding parts of the formation I wanted to practice with and with other runic formations. Only a high-level rune craftsman or someone of equivalent skill would be able to tell what I'm doing and with some luck. The enemy won't even be looking into the pitiful workings of the former elves' leader. Observation seed number 16 during shift. Sad little elf being sad. I transcribe my words while drawing the shapes he is working on, but even Nash would likely not be able to tell what they do. Eyes down, more care for the wood and even more for the living plants in his office, but still a bad elf, even if not so bad as the other new boss man bad man elf. Being a plant wielded by the new boss man bad man elf would be exceedingly painful. The old bad elf, but not so bad elf man boss is careful even when working with simple wood. So yeah, not so bad. Nash's POV. The day's long trip back from Egypt back to Pando City is finally over and I drop the last few remaining people, though a core number still choose to remain in the inner world even though I'm heading into another trial. A few simply because it was a unique environment to experiment, others are just happy to experience something different while some simply grew used to the environment and thought of it as their actual home. I have prepared myself and given all the tools and systems I could think of to the people remaining behind. Now I have to take another step and won't be here if something goes wrong. This time, there is even more ambiguity about the trial. I can't even guess how long it will last, nor how it will change. It might be a couple of days like the last one, or months like my first ones. The increase in wait time can actually mean something, or it might be meaningless beyond that I'm growing higher level, and that is the order of things. I'm likely to still be the one that decides when the trial ends and I doubt that one bad result in the trial would cripple me. But I don't want to make that decision unless it's absolutely necessary. It's an opportunity to grow stronger, and even if I went on an extreme training regime solely focused on combat power, I doubt I could achieve anywhere near the gains that a decent level of success on the trial would entail. Without hesitating a second longer, I give a quick farewell to a few of the friends who returned from the instance to formally found Charlie's village. They for so many reasons end up absorbing most of the Pando's village, but that had been the plan. Though the core group of Charlie's village is still all inside. With way more money they they need to pay for the original village to stay another month or two. That would change as the cost grew at an unbelievable rate, and even a 10-month difference would make the payment about 1,000 times higher, but it is enough for now. I draw in a deep breath as the last preparations all run through my head. The positions of all the bubbles inside the inner world, the longest tendril and its smaller counterparts spread throughout to maximize my capability of finding a matching angle to watch multiple places outside the main bubble of the inner world. Mathematicians had worked long and hard to find the best use of my time, and so I end up with long, angled walkways crisscrossing way farther than the central bubble that took so long to expand. Taping the system screen, I only have to wait a fraction of a second before I'm taken inside the trial, fully prepared and still with Pando's lingering touch on my soul. I have full access to all my stats for another few minutes, including my prodigious perception. Knowing what to look for, I try get a sense of the system's teleportation. I sense the tiniest hint of time before I'm instant teleported, all but confirming I'm subject to a very similar process I witnessed on Ajax in the pyramids. I had left all kinds of instruments in my room to capture the moment, but without someone like me operating them, they aren't really precise enough to give me a high-definition scan of the teleportation, but better than nothing. And if I don't start somewhere, how will I be able to improve the design? I take in my surroundings for the trial, white marble, cut ever so slightly unevenly to imitate artisanal blocks, thought without any tool marks. Long corridors following impossibly perfect lines and alignment that I wouldn't believe even modern earth construction would be able to achieve. This must have been constructed by the system, or at the very least using techniques of a high-level system user. 
but all my conclusions are tinted by the human perception of pre-system developments. And even before, with lasers bouncing all over the ruins and the right technique, we might have been able to reproduce something like this by tweaking each stone millimetrically into place. Then the system pulls my inner world, given the rules of this place. It also tries to lock my resources, but this time I have a good plan. I instantly give up as much ground as I'm willing, which is well over 99, 99-99% of the inner world, but I hold steadfast on a person-sized piece of the inner world. I sensed the system's attention that had been rising, preparing to vehemently fight me, like a dog confused when the owner simply releases the rag doll. But unlike a dog, the system doesn't lose interest and it simply takes most of the inner world away. If I didn't know that this is only an insular response of the system, fully powered by its machine intellect, I would actually feel a bit of pity at denying it its fight. Just surprising it is nowhere near enough to wake the slumbering intellect of the system. That task seems impossible, but I can only take one step at a time, and this is the mountain I'm climbing. So without even getting my feet off the ground by fighting against the system, my exceedingly precise control keeps everything inside myself, and I set out my exclusion zone inside my own body. Still, like this tiny tendril of the system's attention, it hovers almost anxious for the fight, like a watchdog waiting for any scrap of food to fall from the plate so it can steal it. Do you want to play? Yes, yes, you do. Sending out a flickering and teasing scrap of vigor, not enough that I will miss it. Then the system eagerly starts to fight me for it. If I used it quickly enough, I would face no meaningful opposition, but that is not the goal. Now I tease as I fold and lengthen it trying to grow my own capabilities for the minute cost. But the moment ends with the system yanking in triumph from my grip a mode of my own resource, and then the trial starts as I take off and flight forwards, and all my bodily senses are engulfed in darkness. Then I poke a tiny sliver of the resource at the expectant gaze of the machine, to entice the system and learn. Learn all about its endlessly fascinating reactions. Chapter 300 I have loads of fun teasing the system, making it move around me chasing its own tail, but my attention is limited, so I turn to the building map. Some things are still like I expected. The trial didn't get an immense jump like last time. From 500 meters, it went as 600 between corridors, and the length had also increased by roughly those 20%. With less than 50% more total distance if I wanted to run every single corridor, I still expect to end the trial fairly quickly, but I'm not content with just completing it. It has to have other secret conditions, like the one that I unlocked that allowed me to attempt a second trial right after. Even if that wasn't on the cards for some reason, I may have unlocked something else with a little more exploring. Probably not the missing piece of the Easter egg, which I will definitely get this time around. But there is untapped potential here. This time I make sure to actually come in and touch each one of the pictures with the shape I need for the puzzle pieces in the central room. That's exactly what I do, mapping the entire place and physically touching the end of the corridor, both with the puzzle references and the egg pieces. I find all seven egg pieces to form yet another almost complete egg design, though like the last one. Worse yet, the design isn't interchangeable with the last one which had been a faint hope. They are like two ancient written tablets, each missing a piece, but they aren't the same text. Maybe in the future with a dozen of these, I will learn the language, but that day isn't today. The mitral infused roots in my own body do an amazing job keeping me afloat and my increasing level of control avoids some of the negative system attention from using a resource. So I no longer get earthquakes, just from standing still for a few seconds. I take the time to focus more on not only my mana control but also my body. I strain muscles, ligaments, tendons, and bones given that's still the fastest way to move around corners. And saving a decent amount of chi and mana from the inner world a few kilometers away is just a side benefit. In the central room, I slowly teleport the pieces of bread, with runes covering the entire thing and the perception field trained on the process during brief breaks. Now even further attuned to space, I catch glimpses I missed last time. The actual warping needed to induce matter teleportation. Though for now, that's a moot point. My natural space warping powers are nowhere near strong enough to replicate the feat like a buddying telekinesis that can only lift hairballs and paper instead of throwing people around. Such weak powers would be more hindrance than help to move weights in the gym. 
It might be enough to nudge in the right direction, helping to keep the balance, or to lock a machine like a third helping hand. But it doesn't replace actual muscles, nor do I have the mental dexterity to use it instinctively just yet. I also need to figure out how the teleporting runes work. On my way to the central chamber, I follow the Greek architecture. Even with the different veneer compared to the first couple of trials that leaned more towards an Egyptian theme, fundamentally it still has the same structure and it's starting to grow stale. I know that I'm missing something and that keeps me going forward, but I have no idea what that could be. I explore each and every cubic inch of the place. When I finish going through the entire place, I choose a different corridor to go through slower, trying to catch a glimpse of something important. Sometimes I walk, other times I jog. But the two days long exploration grows to six days without new discoveries. I switch things up again, this time running instead of floating and paying more attention to what I'm covering with my perception field. I stop and meditate looking for patterns small and large at every corner. I play with system screens, chi, life, and my old friend Vigor. I fill myself with power and then release it all in a calming exhale, but nothing seems to change. Ether comes to the party as I tap into a portion of Pando's harvested stores and I even brush my precious attuned Ether, but none of that is enough. Still, that is not to say my time is wasted. I grow more used to my skills in the unique environment, even uncovering the intricacies of space runes after another stop at the central chamber. Though without destructive methods I'm unwilling to use on the teleportation table, most insights are small additions to our knowledge base. Staring at the strange, swirling patterns of the eater eggs, patterns that might help me attain a hint of enlightenment once again if I manage to complete isn't fruitless, but the progress is meager gruel meant to fill the stomach rather than provide real sustenance. As I push my runic language skill, it seems to interface ever so slightly with the eggs, but I can tell that it is nowhere near enough for me to call it a success. Without a Rosetta Stone, I'm probably going to need at least a dozen different examples to crack the code. Another week later, I get fed up with the entire exercise, so I tap the return button while interfacing with the blue crystal beside the table in the central room. After confirming my option, another message shows up. A message I hadn't seen a hint of until now, but one brings joy to my heart. Do you wish to attempt the second tier of the trial? A message that is both infuriating and wonderful that encapsulates a hint of the system as a whole and its quirks, given that I know the result to be the same as what was erased from my mind the last time around. But it's a different question. The system keeps changing, and for me, more than most. Like a thousand others of its idiosyncrasies, I have no idea why. I tap the little button, and a slow process starts. A teleportation that has only the barest of time melded into it, and that requires power even the system hesitates to use. I sense the tendrils of its will reaching. I can probably escape if I try, at least for a few instants. The same feels true for the mild temporal suppression, but I don't interfere with the process. Nearly a minute passes in real time, though only about two seconds for me as power builds beneath the surface of reality. With well over a thousand perception points, even those two seconds become an interminable wait as I alter my own perception of time. I try to sense the power building in this underlayer of the system, and not only through normal means, but even catching glimpses beyond the pane of glass that keeps me safe from the madness of the world. All my system gifts help, the mana manipulation, my normal senses, the skill-based perception field, and even the space-slash-time manipulation skill surround my natural version of the perception field. Even then, I only catch the barest of glimpses of what is underneath. Madness strikes as I think about breaking the glass box that is between me and the world, but my gut warns me against it and I listen. However, I'm not limited to them. My natural space sense integrates with the perception field, and even my intuition guides me in understanding the world. The system is using more power than I had ever seen used to this day. The layer of reality anyone else sees is calm like a pristine lake without a single ripple in its surface. But in another dimension, the system thrums with impossible power and this duality threatens to break my brain. With so much will, liquid mana and even other forms of energy like plasma, I expected to see a rendition of reality, vibration and heat wafting off from that confined space but everything is kept under inhuman control by the system. Then the collapse comes in an instant. Like an eternal memory, that power pulls the underlayer of reality 
and I'm suddenly standing elsewhere. My tenuous connection to my inner world extends to infinity. It's both present and yet not. Luckily, I have all the small space I carved out in my own body, something that probably increases the cost of teleporting me, but not much. My senses fully come back. I feel the grass underneath my bare feet, instead of only seeing it with the perception field. Fresh air fills my lungs in the wide open sky. Space shares heaviness and lightness I can't quite comprehend, and the significance of the moment tries to change my natural ether field. I let it. All these tiny increments mold me, and what I experience shapes who I become. This isn't something I'm attempting to avoid. I step forward, but this time. An actual system screen pops up with actual sound, something less than a person in a million people ever experience on Earth if the reports I read are accurate. Warning, death in this place is permanent and no system protections are in place. Interesting. I had seen a lot of the supposed protections of system users, and without some of the limitations placed on the invaders and the malicious people in the instance, we would have been screwed. Maybe even screwed enough we would already be a relic of the past. I focus on my perception field on the surroundings as I walk in a clearing about 200 meters wide. In the spot I arrived, sits a blue crystal similar to the one I encountered in the trial's central room shows up, and this is what finally gets to me. So it's even stranger than I expected. I won't even have to find the safe way out. It's time to explore, though before I actually get an idea of what I will do I probably shouldn't stray too far from the safety. As I step farther and farther away, the very grass follows my movements oh so slowly. In the distance, I sense something changing. The spawning of a single beast over a kilometer away. I run to it. My instinct is to pulse my chi out, but with the limited supply I have at my disposal without the tremendous accumulation I cycle through the inner world, but I try it just the same. The system is as reluctant as ever and in some ways, the restrictions simply got stronger. I can still internally use it, but even if I can communicate with plants and nudge themselves in a particular direction, the uses are limited. I don't stop to properly test it, but even brushing my chi on a plant leaves them disintegrated a moment later as the system erases them from existence. A similar property to the last trials which resembles the void, eroding the foundations of a material and slowly undoing it atom by atom until not even ashes are left behind. The process here may share the same roots, but it's way more violent, as if two different forces were taking similar actions. As usual, my clothes are replaced by the starting garb that will be taken away as soon as I step out and anything I take out of the tiny inner world in my body becomes world enemy number one unless I spend considerable willpower protecting it. I keep one eye on the recently spawned hog that appears to have heard me even while I'm a kilometer away and he is coming closer. But something else calls my attention. An idea that should work, but I still need to test. With my bare feet already touching the grass, I ask them to weave in a particular pattern and slowly, over a minute they come together. I can probably alter their properties if I don't add anything. Asking individual leaves to grow or shrink seems to have some effect. They slowly start the process. I commune with nature in the way I had learned. Some of the things I ask, I know it will take days, days, weeks, or even longer. Time that I will have to constantly be at hand to guide and improve. But if I want, I can construct something. And as the system's interest nor even the mildest hint of the caustic void or system attention arrives, I may not be at full power, nor does my other half have his full capabilities, with the tiniest shards of the seed brain hidden in the small space available inside the piece of the inner world I managed to fit in my body, but he is functional. Then the first spawned hog finishes its charge. It comes filled with complete and utter rage fueled by the dirty rabid ether power that seems to be cheap for the system. Apparently, the system can't clean the ether, so it found another use. The only thing it drives now is to kill, so I answer in kind. With a single punch, aiming at first at its snot, but twisting sideways at the last moment, I karate chop its neck. The fight is over. No suffering, no struggle. The only mercy I can give to the mob. It almost feels unfair, even if I know that there is nothing I could have done differently, not when the system has spawned a dozen others in the time this one approached me. What does any of this have to do with my main class? Grabbing a young tree, with its trunk almost as thick as my arm, 
I pull it from the ground asking for it to give way. It barely helps, but my strength is enough and I break it off without too much twisting. Carrying it a hundred meters away in the middle of the clearing, I start to build the first piece of the puzzle towards protecting myself from the increasingly larger number of beasts. Chapter 301 I stab the ground with my bare hand, opening a hole for the thousandth tree as the math for my construction runs in my head. Unless I had full access to the inner world and I could just rocket through the entire place at supersonic speeds, I don't really have a chance to mop up the number of beasts spawning. They simply appear all over the place. I will only have a chance to last long enough with something at my back, and as strong as I may be, I still need to sleep and rest, so a small fortress is in order. A couple of seconds with one more planted tree, I spin as fast as I can and chop my hand at yet another level 101 beast. Each of them shows equivalent power to the HLZ beasts, but not only is my level higher, but I also have a lot more experience, stats, and my own resources to rely upon. I glimpse the reason why I stayed as long as I did last time around. I may not actually remember my stay inside, but, simple math, taking the temporal compression of the instance into account, I spent about three months if my memory serves me. The beasts slowly grow stronger, and back then I had a much thinner margin last time around. I managed to last a while, but I didn't find whatever victory condition this other trial had. I half dread and half anticipate the system's actions in trying to steal my memories at the end of it all, but I have a few surprises in place for when or if that comes. My island and ether constructs are the cornerstones of my efforts, either of which might be enough, and I'm definitely gonna combine them. I can probably alter my own body to contain that knowledge in a cipher of some kind. But given that return to normal that system put us under before on the way back, I don't trust that. With a sufficiently complex interweaving pattern of the memory palace, I could probably make something that the system would need to erase my entire memory to get rid of everything, but that sounds like the type of daring initiative against the system that would only lead to me only remembering my own name. A few other ideas kick around, but most if not all of them would be countered by the system. If I could take my book of knowledge inside the trial, and write on it the problem would be mute, but that is not to be. Concentrating on more immediate concerns, I hit a drum like construct while whistling. Sound vibrations that would have burst the ear drums of anyone within a hundred feet of me without hearing protection before the system attracts attention from the beasts. Dozens of the mobs start to charge my position. Maybe it's not the most neighborly thing to do, but considering that any stray noise is enough to send them on a murderous rampage, Clearing an area a couple of kilometers wide sounds prudent. A minute later, after cleaning up all the mobs that tried to tear my throat out, an anomaly pops into my perception field. Stealthily flying, it's also while aiming at my neck. I turn around to face the bird. With a three-meter wingspan, but little more mass than a cat, not even reaching 20 pounds, it would have a hard time fighting someone like me. Even if it had been stronger and higher level. But what calls my attention are its stealth capabilities. That's a new skill. A new way of going unnoticed. Curiosity drives me and I send out a single pulse of the nearly unused skill-based perception field. As I half expected, I only sense the faintest of disturbances and I know it's positioned down to a fraction of a millimeter with my real perception field. The world lays itself before me to grasp, understand, and to change. Should I ask and study it? but the system is playing tricks again. The little flying beast changes direction, instinctively realizing I'm not only aware of its presence, but I can actually see it. Not that I was trying to hide that fact. I follow it for a few seconds as it circles around me, but without full access to my power or even the inner world. I can't do much at this distance, so I turn to my own work. What would have been an impressive forest dwelling before the system? especially given the very first layer took me some 10 hours to build. Even now, that little bird could burrow a hole or even knock down my fortress in seconds. Still, every single of the constituent parts is healthy and alive, perhaps not in the same sense as Pando, Aspen, or the other seeds, but alive nonetheless. With a hint of fear and trepidation, I touched the door from the outside. No sense in hiding inside and risking more damage than is strictly necessary during the day. Without all the extraneous use of my chi and other resources, a hint of the wonder of simply communing with nature and altering it as humans have done for millennia comes over me. 
I may have different limitations in a fundamental sense in this place, but like a blind person, my other senses expand and my brain shifts in response. With that in mind, I train myself to be more, significantly more. The instant and careless approach to most of my work slowly vanishes and my entire being perfuses the little home ahead. A chorus of voices from disparate trees and brambles tries to mix song and speech in a chaotic display. Each one is louder and more prominent than the last. I know it would work itself out in time, but I hasten that convergence. I'm the maestro and with sheer presence that has nothing to do with my height or physical makeup, I both ask and impose a hint of order. I understand the limitations, but I take this step with faith, trusting my instincts to warn me of danger. Slow movement comes from everywhere. The very basic knots tying the tree trunks in place and keeping the structure solid become an addition to the slowly forming connections. The disparate notes disappear as the entire thing tries to become one. A tiny fortress grown from true nature. Only a single step in a long journey, a journey I would normally take a minute at the most, now will require weeks and I'm strangely grateful for it. Two weeks just to complete this first step. Even with my constant prodding, nature moves at its own pace and I don't rush it. I only guide it. I need to learn to live with reality instead of trying to override my will on the world every time. With as little leverage as I have now, it wouldn't even make much of a difference. A spike of warning breaks me out of my state probably some ten minutes later. I wait another second and a half before spinning to grab the bird's neck in a single move. My hands hold it like a vice, but I don't squeeze. It squawks, flails, and tries to scratch me, but without leverage, all its efforts are futile. The closest class many would probably classify me before the system. A druid manifests now hiding behind all the weight and pressure I put on top of myself. I feel for the little creature. I had worked long and hard on moving without stopping and as a consequence, those instincts lay dormant far more often than they should. My actual class, one with the world, helps me connect with the bird. I glimpse its entire history in a single moment. Albatross, LV.104. The barest glimmer of intelligence hides behind its eyes. With hints of blood underneath the thick dirt around and standing amidst the graveyard from a thousand of its brothers and sisters, even if the system had taken the corpses away, I know I have a choice in this. A choice that I cannot turn back now. Even if I can almost feel the tainted ether leaking from its ears as the other beasts had and I took from the system. This albatross had already been resurrected a couple of times, but it's mentally intact enough that I could see it surviving further if it managed to overcome the rage the system and its corrupted ether induced on it. It probably won't, but I'm not going to be the one that is going to make that journey harder. If I leave it alive now, it won't be a significant threat to me tomorrow. I bring its beak close to my face. Its nails are capable of scratching deep steel in the tips of its flappy feet, and its beak could probably injure even my skin if I let it, but it still carries that same overall recognizable albatross shape. Even with my constitution, I can't just ignore its threat entirely. I may not be able to afford to do this to all my enemies, especially when they are bearing down on me trying to tear my throat out, but you are free. I try to infuse my words with meaning, to use that hint of the language of the heart and last but definitely not least. I send a spark of life and my attuned ether hoping to counterbalance the corrupted ether of the system. I see potential in this creature and I have to fight my own desire to hoard the precious resource. But I understand that I can't, not if I still want to look myself in the mirror. I drive meaning beyond words into its brain, relying on the visceral and unmistakable knowledge of the gut that is the closest thing it might understand. I'm so strong. You aren't even a real threat. You can grow, you can join me, or you can stay out of the way. Now be gone. That hint of language I'm trying to transmit interfaces with my own runic language skill as I twist it out of shape, not in a mild manner like using a wrench slightly off its axis to give room for its handle, that is still using a tool in the general manner its creator intended. No. I feel as if I'm taking an electric screwdriver and using it as a sledgehammer. I warp the skill and my soul beyond anything recognizable for a moment. That allows me to bridge the gap and I see the barest of glimmers of understanding in its eyes. My soul and the system's ether construct snap back into shape like a rubber band leaving the customary sting, but I don't mind the cost. 
Doing anything would have been callous. The albatross squawks and flees, but I keep my perception field trained on it. Even kilometers away, beyond the circular volume of the perception field, I can see with the narrow corridor. Its nest is some seven kilometers away, and as it hides afraid of the world and myself, I know there is more to it. As simple as its thoughts may be, not reaching the barest level of true sentience, it knows who is stronger and that it will never defeat me. I look at the planes and I turn around to my work in earnest. I opened up the path of that little creature at a cost. Now it's up to him to take the step, if he so chooses. Chapter 302 Weeks pass in my class trial without any real surprises. I explore the surrounding space, reaching about 100 miles from my arrival point, only to find the edge of the allotted part of this world is similar to the edge of the instance. But here I know all this is only a section of a planet. Anyone else would only see an end to reality, and even the system's perception field only encountered an impenetrable wall, but I'm not limited to normal senses. I have a true version of the perception field which allows me true knowledge of the world. The forest continues beyond that barrier almost as if it had been put here a while ago, but without drastic alterations. I still feel a hint of the system's touch on the general organization of the forest inside, it's closer to an alteration made a century or two ago, and then left mostly unsupervised. The pace at which the beasts grow stronger seems relatively tame, and I will be able to stay here for months with my current power, but I still haven't uncovered the tip of any clue to my goal. My tiny wooden fortress, half dug into the ground, with a reinforced two-room system is of great help, though it's only meant to delay an attack while I'm asleep. If the mobs were at my level or even stronger, with how weak the current iteration is, would be more of a liability rather than an advantage. But I will keep reinforcing it based on how the trial develops. Food comes next. Anyone else could simply eat the mobs they kill, but have more options, so I carefully mold the trees to provide me with a constant food supply avoiding introducing any hint of the actual roots I carry with me or any of my resources to accelerate the process. Any attempt to go the easy route would have the system ripping out of reality whatever I touched. The intrepid albatross occasionally circles close by, though never within a hundred meters. He seems to be shifting, moving away to create his new nest even farther than my perception field could reach. I leave pieces of the mobs that can't be reasoned out for him to eat, along with a few seeds, though he doesn't show any interest in that. I wish I could dissuade the mobs, from trying to tear my throat out every time we meet, but they are insistent in their desire to kill me. So they become corpses that the system takes away in a few minutes. But the albatross only eats a pair of times when I move far from the direction I leave the strips of meat behind. I explore each inch of the outer section, not finding a hint of the Easter eggs from the first trial layer. Meditating and trying to absorb the environment seems to be futile. What I learn simply conforms to my expectations. I think of my main class, though I don't know if this trial is only meant for it. My subclasses may tilt the direction, even if the main class is the reason for the trial at all. I take up, as I had started and overlaying both the skill-based perception field and the natural version of it. The lack of any findings doesn't discourage me. I simply keep going without hesitating a second. Meditating in search of the barest hint of enlightenment, I surround myself with reproductions of the eggs from the last trials. I look from the deepest layers to the sky, both in the micrometric sense and also trying to extract even the mildest sense of purpose from reality. My class namesake makes itself manifest, one with the world. I try to connect, I try to extract meaning from reality. Usually it works, even if not in the manner I expect, but now I feel as if I'm trying to force an answer to the wrong question not because it's impossible, but because it bangs against my own preconceptions. What is the right question? That eludes me. Then the month comes to an end and I feel a shift roll over the land. The mobs hide as they sense something even before I do. Something that deeply scares them. Even the leopard that had been slowly sneaking up behind me abandons its half an hour of work and scampers off with no thought to stealth. I have been on this trial for too long. Concern builds over the people on earth, facing the elves and goblins, and the minor invasions without my power, wisdom, and healing. It will be a bit more troublesome than otherwise. Still, they are in as good of a place to act without my input as I could possibly hope in the current conditions. 
Each month, a couple more healers show up back on Earth from the instance. They are a great help, but like other magical users, they can't simply act from the other side of the world like my connection to plants allows. Not the end of the world. We have the logistics to transport them in relative safety, near to battlegrounds, or quickly transport the injured to a central location with the healer. Either way, they are slowly chipping away at my need to spend life, a nearly finite resource. That worry builds in the back of my mind, but I put it off, knowing I can't always be there. No matter how much stronger I am, each person is always responsible for their own actions. If I simply ignore a path to power like my trials, I'm going to end up obsolete and all but powerless in humanity might see a little less need to grow as we all need. I feel a rumble through the earth that gives me a hint of what has scared the mobs. A rumble that doesn't get to my body kilometers away, but it calls my attention on the perception field and I turn the longest tendril in that direction to find a being too large to capture in its entirety. A being that would put the mammoths in the instance to shame. Weighing no less than 30 tons, an elephant charges my position as I start running in her rough direction and away from my little fort. Her steps are the smoothest ever seem, pound per pound, hits I would expect to shake the world and leave craters become veritable feather falls that do vibrate the ground, but fade at an exponential rate, way faster than normal. The hints of a skill and system interference are plain for me to see, and what I'm supposed to do is clearer than ever. I taste the flow of will and something else, the skill being used. It isn't a mana skills or anything of the sort. It works on a different principle, but that probably has nothing to do with my actual goal. Doubts over the entire affair bubble over, but as the elephant gets within a few hundred meters away, I inspect my newest pursuer. Featherfall Elephant. LV. 220. The highest level being I ever managed to inspect and like the Titan, its body size gives it a significant advantage. It moves at a comfortable speed that is faster than anyone had a right to, and even the wind that is such a hassle to deal with for someone like myself simply gets pushed aside by sheer momentum. The very mass it carries is the solution. She isn't forced to rely on tricks as I have to. The wind will eventually become a problem as speeds increase, but the diminishing returns of higher stats will only kick in at about twice the speed a human should experience. All that before accounting for skills, though I don't feel anything stronger than my own in that department. The terrain, our relative stats, my restricted usage of chi, and a hundred other parameters enter a complex formula that I half hand wave it into existence. But that follows instincts I try to hone with the perception field while in the instance with tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of mobs. I judge its top speed to be a hair less than my own, but I'm gonna have quite a bit more maneuverability. Now, what does this behemoth has to do with my one with the world class is a mystery, but I don't have time for philosophical questioning. Stand and fight, or run. A hybrid. I wait for the before taking off running, and almost instantly I sense it shifting its direction. A system screen pings very softly, comparatively speaking, but this time I don't ignore it. Survive for one hour to continue your trial. 57 mètres 28 sec. Interacting with the screen doesn't reveal anything more, and I still have to wonder at the rationale behind it all. The only new thing is my attacker, so my perception field goes back there. I look at its entire body, from the composition of its skin to the neurons firing at unbelievable rates. Its thinking process seems fairly simple, so I won't be able to communicate with it to any meaningful degree. I cover every inch of its body until it comes near. When the system's version comes into range, I learn nothing new. One day, it might make a difference. Perhaps I could properly integrate both skills together and never run the risk of the system not showing me something because it didn't know I was looking. My mind turns over the idea of running a system skill on top of my own. It would give me a bit of work, and I would still want my natural version to act without knowledge of the system, but it's something to work towards. Running in between trees that probably seemed almost like styrofoam to my pursuer, who even if it didn't have a perception field of its own, had some other way to locate me. I managed to gain a small lead, even without pushing my all. I end up leaving the job of parting the wind to my other half. It's extremely important to both save my limited resources and will. Even with our willpower to back the effort I see as simply atrocious efficiency, but it's a dimension I'm fast seeing gains that probably will continue until I catch up with everyone else. 
My attention gets drawn to the organs of the beast behind us. A few seem off place. The impressions they pass are strange. For equidistant solid meat blocks that don't seem to serve a purpose following a line that would be roughly where a belt would go if it was trying to imitate a human. I run through everything again. All my anatomy knowledge from before the system and the hundreds of books I added after to improve my healing. My senses follow the blood flow, cleaning, recharging, and pumping. The digestive system, acid emits several layers of mechanical and chemical decomposition. Stores of fuel, a few organs seem to be unidimensional in their function while others seem to interface with everything on the body, but the solid blocks don't seem to be anything. They are weak. I would induce a tremendous amount of blood flow if I wound it there. Spinning my body in its direction ready to spend a chunk of the accumulated chi over the last month. In the tight cycle inside the last piece of the inner world I carry within my body. Although it is quite a decent amount, I do need to be careful in a long fight. With sparks of chi ready at hand, to save whatever little life I was able to accumulate, I close in. The lumbering beast moves much slower in close quarters, but that is only an artifact of the distances involved. Sure it does take twice as long to tuck its leg than a normal-sized elephant, but I also need to be twice as far to avoid being hit. I can sense its coiling muscles and as I move in, and I suddenly have to be ready to shift and dodge in a dozen different directions simultaneously. Gluing my feet to the ground I move like a dancer around its own reactions. Finally, when I close enough, I strike my palm on the hide covering the useless organs, and I pulse my chi inside its body. A tiny hole forms letting out a blood jet as if I had poked a big ballon. Seconds later, the blood flow staunches, just as I pass its other side and repeat on the one I can from the ground. If the system needed something physical to detect my discovery, it will be clear now. The elephant gets even more enraged and its body flows with a thin layer of flames. Flames I can't feel the heat off from meters away, but my perception field is goes haywire. Its trunk swings back and forth trying to hit me. I'm nimble on my feet and when not sparing resources for a few seconds, I close in once again, taking off in the sky for a moment and exposing myself. But my aim is true and my palm hits the side of its back on the third, weak, spot past its flaming body. Changing plans in the last second, as its reaction seems farther than before, I jump away as fast as I can hurtling myself in the direction of a pair of trees, either of which will give me options. I sense the light damage my body even from a momentary touch with those flames. It's nowhere near what I imagine void flames would be able to inflict, but it's way more than I had seen anyone wielding. But this is likely a LV 200 plus skills, and we hadn't encountered those yet. I feel my cells slowly turning back from an inflamed state and second degree burn. A wild swing misses me, but it does hit the pair of trees I was aiming at. I miscalculated the range of motion of the elephant, and suddenly both of the points I could use to redirect myself are gone. Its motions seem almost random, and I thank my lucky stars that it didn't manage to hit me. Then it all clicks together and I realize what the strangeness of those organs was. They aren't real organs, they are system organs meant to be weak points. But beyond that, they allow for something akin to the perception field, or at least a locator for me. Now it only has one left intact. My realization fades in the middle of the complex web that allowed me to realize it. I have a much greater problem. I'm exposed. My weak propulsion runes push me away at a very slow rate and an enraged turns its head to track me with its working organs, its eyes. I no longer have much of an option for safety. At the mercy of gravity, my mind spins. Spending a lot of resources doesn't seem so bad now, does it? If I could, I would trade a million, even for a mild increase in gravity, I would. Chapter 303 The world comes into focus as I'm left at this elephant's mercy. Yes, I have a billion responsibilities and wishes, but first and foremost I need to survive. Increasing gravity would take too long. Even with preparation, it would barely be of any help. Using my roots comes with severe drawbacks in this environment. Its trunk, which is as wide as my torso in the narrowest point. I need to get out of the way, especially given it not simply aiming to hit me, but to grab me. With my perception stat, I have the best thing short or an eternity to think. But I also need to start as soon as possible as possibilities reduce each moment. 
Most of my usual maneuvers can't done now without the Anir world, and the few that can won't be effective. A hundred plans spin in my mind, but none seem possible. My demise approaches, and I seem to only have one shot. Using the very limb hurtling towards me to push off from, I wait the last fraction of a second before it's time to act. Infusing my entire body with resources and burning vigor like it's water, I windmill my Mars and legs while bending my spine to position my feet towards the incoming attack. The elephant, ready to grab me, doesn't expect my reaction. A moment later, I glue my feet in the off angle that I managed to get into, and then I try to push off. Half of my body contracts in reflex trying to keep itself intact and keep my bones attached in the correct position, and I feel myself failing at that. The attack sends me hurtling to the ground at neck-breaking speed, but that is the best I could have hoped for. I avoid its backswing trying to grab me once again, and then I'm outside its immediate range. I just barely manage to turn my feet to the ground, adding to the mild pain reaching through the adrenaline, but life infuses my every motion and everything is already healing. Sprinting as fast as possible for a second to create some distance, our dance begins. With some distance and my life no longer an immediate threat, I move and dodge nearly effortlessly while coming up with contingencies and preparing to come in closer at least one more time. Without being forced to prepare everything in mere moments, dozens of options pop up, along with getting a better understanding of how quickly and in what positions its body can contort. I try to maneuver several times to hit it without overly exposing myself to danger until the moment comes. I jump in a carefully calculated maneuver in between the trees, then tap on its left upper back on the last, weak point. A second later, its wild swing also misses me a second time but takes the nearby trees out of my reach and I'm left in a similar position to last time. Meters in the air with nothing within touching distance. But this time I'm prepared. In my hands, a storm of chi and the tiniest hint of the precious life I accumulated. Explode growing a thin rope of roots some four meters long and connecting me to the nearest standing tree. I pull with all my strength until the system destroys the growth touched by my hand. But that's enough. I'm moving in the right direction. Before the elephant can step in range, I grab the trunk of a tree and pull myself. Safety. If before I had been moving conservatively around the elephant, now I'm downright paranoid. Staying well away and no longer even putting myself in any meaningful danger to figure out its limits. Moments later I'm firmly planted in the ground with the roots coiled just under my skin and she ready to explode in an emergency after having touched and injured all four of the weak spots of the mob. Safety lasts for a whole minute. But then I start a push once again. I don't simply seek a thrill, nor do I happily dive into danger, but I need to learn. And I end up only giving love taps on its thick hide, carrying the momentum my high stats allow reinforced by impact wards. I probably tap its legs, trunk, and even the pair of weak spots that I can from the ground a hundred times, all in relative safety. It's nowhere near the level of danger that jumping on its back entailed, but I try to keep my head screwed on straight, instead of daring for more and more. The hour runs down and the system takes the beast away, the fight and blood running through my veins die down and I can finally stop to analyze it all. I entered the fight full of myself. Sure, I took a few precautions but I'm far too used to fighting from an advantage with a forest fully ready to support me. The perception field is nowhere near as limited as the system's skill amidst a thousand other little tricks add up. The system showed me now that I have to be way more capable than what I have shown. I'm not enough. I need to do, to be better. I may not know how or why this trial took this turn, but one wrong move will be my last. Maybe I don't need to rely on force nearly as often. Proper strategy may have allowed me to be relatively safe when confronting the enemy. I look at an intrepid albatross, already flying back and forth a mile away. My attempts to look into his eyes again hadn't been successful. Still, I leave a tiny bowl of meat strips out as an invitation. I walk past the signs of the fight that spread over kilometers where I used my raw power to bend the world to my desires. My mind works on an imperfect solution that will only affect some of my actions but I can probably find more depth to my soul and take another step away from the rat race. If I manage, it might help me shelter those I hold dear and the ones under my protection. 
I want to always act as I have towards the albatross. But playing a game requires two willing parties, and if I have to take the scissors to the football in order to protect those I hold dear, I won't kill the fun. Drawing on my main class, I interface with the world around me. The beasts around me will probably come to annoy me until I either kill or lock them in a cage. A few of the braver ones are already moving closer to our battleground. Every single one is full of rage, an infinite well of negative emotion powered by that cursed ether. There is little reasoning beyond what aligns with the intent to destroy. Ether I can't touch until they die. But although I do absorb a little from the system when the occasion presents itself, that isn't my goal. A thought strikes me. Those murderous instincts may be strong, but they gave way before an overwhelming being. Perhaps that is what I need. Directly interfacing with nature, though at a limited range without Pando's DNA in their makeup, I reach a couple of hundred meters. I don't want to simply induce fear, nor do I believe that is what the situation demands. I expand my aura in a similar manner to the elephant. Not trying to be intimidating, but seeking the correct mentality. I'm strength. I'm power. I'm death to those that wish me ill. I stand alone at the pinnacle. I may not be able to ignore their threat, but if I get the balance right, they may flee rather than fight me. I won't lie spouting that I still hesitate to kill those threatening me, but if I want to create another path, a greater path, I have to start now. It has been too long already. My attention is laggy, trying to hold on to all of this territory filled with chaotic nature. Moving through Pando's territory, directly or indirectly, is the only thing I know how to do. I need to figure out how to operate in foreign places rather than making the world in my image. The day will come I will have to fight for my life in the worst possible conditions, and I rather do it now, where there is at least the veneer of fairness and a hint of control. Somewhere, I'm still under some of the system's protections. I feel a drag to my every action from keeping my aura expanded. The connection, the raw power I have available, how I can wield it, and the weight that each of my moves carry. I'm only gonna need much more practice. To come back to normal making this into something as easy as breathing like I managed for my inner world's functions. As a beast gets within range, it hesitates. Not enough that it retreats, but its advance is much more cautious. I'm on the right path. Automaton CPOV. The enemy is acting up. They are getting too uppity. They are about to do something. When is Nash coming back? Thousands of public messages on the network and dozens on the perception field bounce in the back of my mind. Every second of waiting is interminable when I'm this anxious. But reality doesn't move at my pace, it moves at the slow human pace if not slower. The wooden walls of the lab, inside Pando's secondary inner world piece, are covered with pipes and wires even making the very job of finishing up the reactor slower. The fully biological beings learn to deal with time and space constraints, and I could probably let go and try to slow myself down to deal with one of those. But I won't. I will make everything and I will think as fast as I can, all the time, for 100% effectiveness. I won't allow myself to slow down just because it's boring. That is where defeat lies. Humans developed incredible levels of patience. Something my tree heritage should have taken care of is probably within the top 100 highest priority goals for me. Patience. Patience. I need to work on it. So important, patient for days, years? I have patience, I just, just, no, I don't. The clock ticks with nearly idle work, comparatively speaking. I can see how close the last few bolts are to the proper tension in the final checklist toward the delivery of the fourth fusion reactor. But no matter how excruciating the wait is, it eventually ends. 28 minutes, 14 seconds, and 358 milliseconds late. But that is actually good for humans considering the complexity of the job. The fourth room inside the primary lab on one of Pando's faux inner worlds is online. My mind phases the perception field over the entire reactor with greater precision than any other seed, given the reactor sits inside a faux inner world and I inherited that particular skill from Nash. I do one last thorough check on the latest design. This time I don't find a single screw that needs an extra newton meter nor any slightly loose wire that needs crimping or other obvious flaw. Skipping this step would be asking for it to melt down the first time we turned it on, and then I would have to come back to the third reactor design while this was fixed. Directly interfacing with it through the grown roots, I expand my efforts. 
The other researchers and operators are already used to my shenanigans, and I'm kind of the lead researcher, except when it comes to dealing other the other humans, their lousy schedules and acquiring materials, the boring stuff. A few of the best researchers that had been hard at work in getting things ready go back to the third reactor, but I remain with the bulk of them. There is still more to be learned there. I just rather work on the bleeding edge. Getting things in place to turn it on also takes forever, but I'm taking direct action to address what is missing. So it's the good kind of forever. The forever I wouldn't mind too much if it actually lasts forever. Deep steel plates, covered in a polished reflective film, form a nearly fully functional reactor. We are short of the actual goal, but this is probably the first design with any real considerations for practical usage with the hope of working. We just need to get the balance right. The engineers continued to upgrade the grounded ship. We wouldn't see the fruits of their labor until we managed to get the heart of the metal best working, but they keep pushing past expectations, creating and improving it in every conceivable manner. We finally got the budget we wanted approved with this design. The day is coming closer. This core used nearly a kilogram of mithril which ate a decent chunk of the world's supply, let alone just our village. It will definitely not be an option for every ship, especially the larger ones. Way too expensive for the small trinket that it is compared to the possibilities. But this is a prototype, we will figure out how to make it cheaper in the future. Maybe even find a way to forego mithril altogether. It seems possible. My attention comes to fuel streams entering it as powerheads to the magnetic containment. The balance of energy and matter had been precisely calculated, the cycles of magnetic confinement trying to replace mana shields where possible and the water meant to cool and extract energy from the reactor are all in place. We will probably move to direct energy conversion similar to more common magneto-hydrodynamic generators on future designs, but for now, this will have to do for now. This magnificent work of art crosses that first and easiest threshold. The scientific gain factor reaches 1.1. 1.2, 1.5, and then it collapses, coming short even the last design's record. But now we have the data needed for tuning the thousands of fuel injectors and the actual alignment of the magnetic fields. We will run it again until we get to two, then regroup. This design should be able to get there easily. My mind spins and I can already see a thousand tweaks I could manually apply to allow a higher level of efficiency. It won't be directly useful for the mass-produced version, but it will probably allow us to reach the magical engineering or real break-even point. With magic, it has come down to a very low range. I forced this last shift into measuring the theoretical input of energy against the theoretical output, but the real against real value accounting for all the little inefficiencies inherent to any transformation. That number instantly comes down to about 0.4. I will get it to 1 and beyond and then, the sky will be mine. Chapter 304 New Archdruid's POV. So, there is a high likelihood he is gone. I hear directly from the head of our scouting department. As curtailed as their efforts are, they are far from useless. I glance upward as he continues, taking in my office's ceiling built beside the central safe zone. We don't have direct observation of most of the places we would need to confirm our hypothesis, but the statistical outliers are pretty convincing. He probably brought everyone back from near the goblin invasion point, and then he disappeared. But this isn't the first time he has been completely absent. I don't want to speculate too much, but the system must have taken him somewhere. His words bounce on my mind. As much as the old archdruid's cowardly warnings aren't helpful, simply hurting the morale and engendering paranoid thoughts in our lower-level troops, he isn't completely wrong. These humans are dangerous outliers. And statistics don't lie. At most, the analyst will have misinterpreted it. Maybe we are shy of where I would like to be, but assuming their analysis is correct, the balance of power will invert landing squarely on our side. Each day that passes, however, we only risk them pulling another surprise, Nash's return, or even something like them spontaneously closing the holes in their defense. Knowing that if I'm wrong I could be further doming our side, but consigned to the gamble, I speak. Okay, we will go ahead. I thought that you might say that, so I brought... What? You gave the go-ahead without? I'm no timid leader like the last one. We need to take risks to succeed, and you made a good case. Are you in any way uncertain in your conclusions? If so, tell me now before we make a colossal mistake. No, no, it just surprised me. If you want, I have a lot more arguments and data. 
I shake my head so he asks the obvious next question. How long till we leave? I only think for a few seconds. Any decision will have to balance a thousand conflicting priorities. Just deciding something is probably the best answer. Leaving my mind fresh to work around a concrete timeline is more useful than burning myself out looking for the perfect one. I will just pick something reasonable. Two days. We will leave at noon at the maximum sustainable pace for long distances. That's yes, sir. I will see to it. We all will. Now be on your way. I turn my head upwards once again in deep thought, trying to think of how to counter the human's advantages in the remaining time as thoroughly as possible considering they likely won't have their ether wielders help. Pando's and Charlie City's command center. Russell's POV. I watch everyone sitting around our round table. Simplicity in form and function with a hint of beauty in the oiled wood. But neither its presence and nor that of the decorations call for our attention. Our purpose and discussion are what sit in the center, and our weekly meeting moves predictably. Nash isn't back yet? No, his trial must have taken longer than we thought. At least we can probably expect a higher reward, right? I don't know, he usually has to scrape by his own merits. My impression is that the system is growing even more reluctant to give him any advantages. But he may be able to get something interesting by pulling his shenanigans. I don't know. He seems plenty integrated with the system. He got multipliers for days to get to his stats and stuff very high. Sensing the discussion between the other members has started to pick up steam. I interrupt and bring it on point. That's all beside the point. We know the enemy is up to something. We just have no idea what. Now is probably the worst time to encounter a new major threat. But we need to learn to walk on our own feet without Nash to pull us out of the fire. Come on. We aren't children. Yes, we are. As much as I like to say otherwise, I say. Every misstep we make, he comes in and saves our asses. He is single-handedly responsible for more than a third of the most important developments on Earth, if we count the research made by the people he brought back from the instance. Hell, in the simple attacks we have been running, our casualties have shot through the roof without his healing and decent sections of our fighters have to spend days or weeks meditating to recover after any big battle. Casualties are still way lower than anything we could hope for early system users, but you all know how much of that is based on Pando and the seeds and knowledge, most of which are the results of his meddling. Pando wouldn't be alive today, without him going above and beyond. I even hear people talking about hunkering down if this threat is too much and waiting for our savior to come back in our own village. I'm not gonna lie and say that I'm certain that won't be necessary, but it's the very last step after we fail in every other manner. We shouldn't keep crying for him to save us every time someone stubs their toe. Everyone reacts, tightening their jaws and attention and straightening their spines. They know the implications if people start to take talk like that seriously. A few wanted to object and I make note of those with the propensity to such thoughts. It will be good to know who I can count on when things get tough. Don't get me wrong, nothing wrong with taking the advantages he gave us and running with them, but we need to add to it as fast as possible, especially now. Don't think for a second that our prominent position as Pando's village in the world is simply hard work. Without Nash at our back, the reassembling U.S. Army would have started to pull their crap and we would be reabsorbed in a split second. We need to take the breathing room he gave us and prove we can stand on our own. A hint of seriousness is reflected not only on the surface of their faces, but rooted in their thoughts. Seriousness I had seen snap in place any time action was required. For better or worse, they are some of the best people out there. But we need a little more of this mentality. This seriousness needs to flow out in the city. The willingness to snap into action instead of endlessly arguing. The meeting proceeds smoothly until we finish the strict business. A few minutes of silence build as we start sending messages implementing what we discussed. Then someone breaks the silence. Why did you give the cheesiest speech possible? Asks my counterpart from Charlie's Village, officially marking the end of our discussion. Oh, this is nowhere near as cheesy as I can make it. I play along. As we get ready to leave and put the world to order the holographic map in the table shifts. Everyone's faces is drawn to it. The yellow tab for the elves just switched to orange, and everyone knows what that means. Levity is gone. The time is now. Even before I can speak about their preparations as reports start arriving, 
It again shifts to a red icon, a rapidly rising number which takes only a split second to go from three to five digits and rapidly rising. The enemy plan is in motion, I say. A scout in the corner of the room, as connected to the direct feed as possible and able to speak with much more precision about what the map attempts to represent. Varying size groups are leaving the elf city, all in different directions. On the way out, they are grabbing what we thought were formations to protect their city. How many? Someone asks, though I can see the counter already at 5 million, just as clearly as everyone else. It seems almost all of them is on the way out. If my impression is correct, 70 million. That leaves about 10 to defend their city, but that's plenty with deep in their territory. As the map shifts to focus on their moving groups, I can see a couple of million elves coming straight for our fort, but for some reason, I doubt they are going to try to crack this particular nut. Drilled responses start from around that forward outpost and teams start to take off in the sky in the flying buses, each with many lesser flying vehicles of its own so they can spread out after arriving in a region. They wouldn't be quite as fast as foe inner world powered ones, but they are a lot more effective at running down after thousands of small groups if the enemy chooses that path. In the past, we came close to them in running speed, but they started to abuse their wind runners more and more revealing their actual capabilities. Now even groups in the range of 100 with a quartet of windrunners are too fast to hit without overwhelming numbers and expert maneuvering. A few of our more talented mages could act similarly to windrunners, but like Nash's attempts, it required a lot of willpower and mana while yielding an inferior result. Worse yet, larger groups aren't much faster than small ones without techniques. We still can't replicate the kinetic lines that help spread the load. Luckily, even basic flying vehicles are enough to catch up even to their fastest group. If only I knew what they are up to. So we could wait for them to come OT us instead of pursuing them. They roughly know our capabilities. The incremental improvements of both our sides were well documented. A similar strategy didn't work the last time they tried it. But something is different now. They aren't just testing the waters. They must have something significant up their sleeves. Teams of mages gather around in the adjoining rooms analyzing the new formations they are grabbing on the way out. Sure, nobody is as well suited to diving into the enemy's head and deciphering engraving as Nash, but out of hundreds of thousands of talented mages around the world, we will discover something. This, like the thousands of formations of the enemy had been deemed a low-priority project, but it should have been given at least a few research teams given it is one of the most common formations in the enemy city. This just strikes me as getting comfortable while hiding under Nash's umbrella. Oh, we don't need to build a roof. This umbrella covers everything. It will never rain inside our homes. The low-hanging fruit is that it is probably some type of offensive talisman. But the specifics are too vague. Nor can we rely on this insight. Not even the lower rank archdruid elf on our side who knew a bit of rune work could decipher its purpose, never having properly learned the art of engraving. Sure. It's only a small impediment to us now, but letting their very troops live in ignorance for centuries or millennia just sounds wrong. Only dedicated crafters and higher-level archdruids learn how to go beyond copying runic design templates. This way of organizing is just a small piece of a huge machinery of control of their people, making them dependent on the empire's goodwill. Though I can't say the strategy doesn't have any other advantages. The elves can engrave something they don't understand. If the average crafter knew nothing about engraving, they would have to develop different methods from us. If we just carve the shapes without at least a passing understanding of each rune's function, it just fizzles out, but somehow the enemy doesn't face that problem. Then the time for discovery arrives, as a group thousand strong comes across one of the smallest enemy groups with about 500 elves. With no room left for maneuvering, they start to fight with most of their strength but they don't even move to touch the little piece of engraved wood or copper they carry. They went to all this trouble only to let it go to waste, though this might not be a place or a situation where its effect is useful. No, they are hiding its effects for a little longer. After a few minutes fighting, we round off the last of them. One casualty on our side. An unlucky sod that made the wrong move stepping outside the shield's protection. Only a dozen elves surrender. Even without Nash, they managed to transition everyone still alive to a section of the faux inner world in a few large cells. A minute later, the patch of dirt the fight happening is scoured clean and they take off for another elf group while licking their wounds. 
Similar scenes rise all over the place as dozens of groups get cornered, and though it will take a while for us to manage to kill or capture every single one amongst the enemy, their defeat at this pace is inevitable. Hours pass after the enemy, simply ignored all our major installations. There is always the risk they might try to hit the small outposts, but we made sure to create good hiding places shielded from every form of detection they have available. Thousands of orders and small maneuvers were thought up and discussed in small groups in our command center. Then the moment we had been waiting for comes. A small group that had been going faster than most of the others arrives at a section we hadn't explored but probably contained a mine of something of the sort. The system always pushes Pando's roots out from those spaces and most people couldn't even step more than a kilometer inside without peeing their pants and fleeing. The elves ran some 1,700 kilometers to get here and they enter as if they own the place. Almost instantly, as if timed with the precision of a digital clock, a hundred nearby groups simultaneously switch directions. And given they still don't seem to have communication tech that works at this range, this had always been the plan. So, you figured out this location beforehand. The enemy steps out from our network. Now with the only thing we can do to watch visually with the help of a nearby drone in a hidden cache set up remotely specifically for this area. The small basic flying camera struggles to keep itself in the air so near to the flight-restricted zone, constructed entirely of wood from thousands of miles away by either Nash or more likely one of his seeds. My mind starts to spin, even as a few minutes later I see the enemy emptying bags of holding similar to what we acquired from the instance. Nowhere near as useful as Nash's faux inner worlds, but way better than nothing and not quite as limited of a resource. But it is still expensive and our own versions were acquired from the instance and limited given the cost and small number of unlocked shops. So, this time, it's not only food and replacement equipment. It must be fortifications. They intend to hold ground. I say in thought and a few of the heads around start nodding. I order a few more of the nearby flying vehicles in that direction. The aura of fear will hinder us, but even if the elves are better at dealing with it, it will affect them. Still better than fighting inside their territory. Then my gut stops mid-motion leaving me in a state of uncertainty. The enemy wouldn't have committed so many of their number if they weren't sure. What will we discover when the enemy finally faces us? Chapter 305 Earth Pando's Village Commander POV For other elf groups arrive before we begin our attack. Luckily. The closest flying bus had a large contingent of troops with a few that split off in pursuit. Nearly 80,000 of our frontline warriors like spear wielders and tanks besides the magic users and support staff all arrive inside the territory the system never allowed Pando to explore. The enemy, however, only has some 40,000. Thigh they are constantly getting reinforcements. As our troops get within visual range, I start to get higher resolution pictures, revealing their larger runic formations. Pando's influence grows, but only in the immediate area that our troops step upon. Before it had been non-existent, but now, through mechanisms I don't understand the system allows new growth. Our nature wielders, mages and druids make use of the opening as Pando gets its first real taste of the territory. We prepare to crush the enemy's wooden defenses, but fire sprouts from the hastily constructed walls. Even from thousands of miles away, I feel my skin sweating as if I were on the front lines. Fire from their druids transforms the wood into something akin to charcoal. All the influence that nature magic should have had on their fortifications is gone. It's probably a lot weaker now, but the mana backing it and the strange design give me pause. A hint of the puzzle is revealed to me. They are doing things differently. Then I notice the fear the system induces on anyone inside seems to affect the enemy less than our own troops. Though entering this place with tens of thousands at the back in pursuit of the enemy probably helped our side. Normally the majority would have already fled, but they are in place. Maybe this is a good strategy instead of relying on Nash or a couple of other outliers to explore every single one of these places. It probably won't be enough to take over all of them, but maybe we could add a couple of mines. With no delay, our attack starts. The enemy tries to make use of their meager advantages, their lesser environmental restraint, their fortifications, and much longer war experience, but we have our advantages and the pendulum is leaning to our side. Still, we don't have too long to enjoy as 20,000 enemy reinforcements approaching from both our sides and our rear lines. 
I order a shift in the formation to better defend in the three minutes before our next wave of reinforcements. Just 60,000, but enough to maintain a healthy lead. Meanwhile, only a tiny trickle of our troops gathers off after arriving in the slower and smaller flying buses after having temporarily abandoned pursuit of smaller contingents. They don't carry dozens to hundreds of thousands at much higher speeds without the wonders of the foe inner world. But there are a lot more common flying buses. My mind tries to find the best way to counter the enemy and how many reinforcements should I order to the region. Then all thoughts flee as streams of red warnings pop up. The shield and all other defenses are in place, but dozens of our soldiers die each moment. Chaos ensues. Any orders I might have been thinking about become a really low priority. I shouldn't interfere lightly, not unless I have information the local commanders lacks. This is now your fight. Complete and utter surprise echoes in the leaders' and diplomats' faces around. Faces who are here because we may have a centralizing agency in the world, but most troops aren't ours, and now is the moment they are actually here for. To witness exactly this kind of atrocity, how it happened and pass accurate details to their own governments. The closest thing to panic since we started this exercise seeps into the room. Worst yet, this isn't a loss on an unlucky fight where a dozen people get isolated against ten times as many enemies, and they still manage to make a decent showing killing half of the enemy even as they are cut down. This was supposed to be a relatively normal fight with us holding the upper hand. In barely five seconds we get about 100 casualties. Even the surprise of the others and the chaos they summon is of little concern. The troops on the ground may not realize yet, but this is an order of magnitude worse than we feared. This isn't a few clumps of deaths from another type of super attack that a powerful new archdruid could use, but spread all over the line the enemy starts targeting individual people. Pinpoint attacks limited only by line of sight. The enemy may not have chosen the perfect targets, but as we lose numbers it will expose our weak points. A dozen images arrive in the corner and I call more team of mages to decipher the runic formations and develop a counter now that we have actual data on the threat. Whatever those cursed instruments actually did to accomplish this. I pull up the visual record to try to catch the moment that one of our fighters died then play it back, trying to extract anything. For tiny formations in the hands of elves come together to generate small transparent attacks, similar to wind blades. They slice through layers of powerful shields like it's water. The only reason they don't target the mages powering our shields are those standing at the front lines. However, as they get used to the attacks and our shields people further back on the third and fourth lines start to fall. Though why they don't use height advantage to target the mages at the back directly confuses me. Maybe there is a range limitation. 300 dead in a battle, just 12 seconds long. Our lines experience the first signs of collapse, as confusion suffuses the people around the fallen. I override the local commanders and give an order I didn't want. It's the right one, and we can always come back after regrouping with a proper plan, but it doesn't seem likely. I could let the local commander decide, or even order them to hold ground for a lot longer, they would probably obey beyond any chance of victory, but that would serve no purpose. Retreat is the only option. In seconds the entire line is moving in a coordinated fashion with the local commander's blessing. The enemy tries to keep us pinned, and though their maneuvers are successful in forcing suboptimal retreat lines, and for us to split the group in two, our cooms are something we had long worked out, with both visual and audio cues. Without even matching our number, they fail to do more than leave a thin trail of dead as we retreat. We disengage with a relatively modest number of casualties given the conditions. Nearly a thousand died against less than 500 enemies. Those losses would have been closer if we hadn't retreated, which allowed a few more openings to the enemy, but it's still a defeat. Our first actual defeat. Oh, that was a shit show, says a rising warlord from Alaska. Luckily, his title is only in name, rather than a consequence of raids to acquiring more territory by force. This is our first actual unmitigated defeat? Anywhere near this scale without our side being caught by a much larger group, yes. We should have pressed the attack. The loss ratio seemed reasonable. We need to understand and eliminate this threat as soon as possible. Another warlord who came in person speaks. Though he is only here for political considerations, rather than his upstanding character and our desire to associate with him. And though we don't have proof, 
His likely association with an old enemy ensures we will keep him at arm's length. No, interrupts one of the most talented human mages who has returned to Earth. It seems he had been paying attention instead of focusing exclusively on figuring out a magical counter to the enemy's attacks. Even considering there are stronger mages still in the instance, of the ones already back, only Nash's surpasses his skill leal. Even the mages who had decades to improve their skills in the inner world after Nash's early return are only at his rough level. What? A few people ask, echoing my thoughts, but I just wait patiently. They are slicing through our shield like it's butter with those spells. The formation they are carrying is doing half the job, but we need a real counter before we go poke our heads in there again. The trade only looks favorable, for now, because we didn't lose anyone important to the defense efforts. They can aim at specific people, and as soon as they are in a position to start killing the mages powering the defense our entire effort will collapse. We haven't learned how to fight on even ground, let alone in these conditions. The new military commander of Charlie's village points out to hammer the point home. Their words silence the room for a good 30 seconds until everyone's faces are turned to me, not knowing what to think. I simply say, I may not be a mage to talk about the magic, but they are right. That puts the last nail in the coffin of anyone hoping to come back without more preparation. My mind turns over the problem as we discuss it for the next few minutes, and I get a dozen estimates as to how long developing a counter will take. In the midst of battle, with the quick interactions, maybe we would be able to accelerate development slightly, but tens of thousands of dead is a price worth paying. Nash would have probably already created a barely functioning design in seconds, but now we are stuck with the most optimistic estimate of an hour, so remaining would be foolish. Even one hour sounds like a pie in the sky dream. Worse yet, they carry subtly different designs of that cursed formation, and that probably means they tune them to bypass several types of shields. Then a comm room operator starts speaking. Another portal has opened up. My mind halts trying to grasp the implications of his words. This isn't something that we had planned for, nor how we should address it, but instantly my mind goes straight I realize what is the most important question even as I hear him on the other side tapping buttons and connecting to other people trying to get more information. This portal links where? Giza Pyramid and the Goblin City. And what are they doing? So far nothing, but I don't think they would have turned it on just to look at the pretty space swirls. They are probably waiting for it to stabilize. The strategic implications of this bounce around my head. Although there is still too much in the air, I start to piece things together. Without plans to attack soon, I split the stream of reinforcements to the region of our first loss, but still kept in place enough faux inner world fast flying vehicles to evacuate them just in case. For now, Focusing on the smaller elf groups will be more productive. Though again, as if it had been timed. The enemy spread out enemies also begins to attack with the new shield-piercing formations. Even attacks on small groups with overwhelming numerical superiority become dangerous. With those talismans, just about any confrontation closer than 20 meters results in a couple of deaths on our side. The hour pass and I compile the data coming in. Melee fighters become nigh useless beyond the little mana they can provide and as sacrificial body shields. A few rare tanks with a relatively high constitution stat can survive the attacks long enough to close the distance and kill the opposition. A few from the fastest scouts also manage to dodge the attacks with decent odds, and even a large groups of mages infuse shields with an overwhelming amount of will. But those are the exceptions even against a single quartet of talisman wielders to generate the attacks. With two groups, getting close is a death sentence. A tank that can survive a pair of shots attacking would get skewered before even getting past the enemy's mana shield. There is nobody quite at Nash's level of everything at once. Tough, fast, and capable of manipulating mana at will. Still, even keeping our distance and abusing our mages, the trickle of injured and dead is greater than ever as what had been funny mistakes in the past become affairs of finality now. But cruel as the thought is, my mind turns to how much faster their sacrifice makes the development of a better shield design. The flow of the battle is different from anything before and the enemy alters it yet again. Thousands of windrunners form a line to cross the stabilized portal fed by tremendous mana stores in the elven city. They wouldn't be able to send more than a small fraction of their numbers to the other side of the world, 
but they wouldn't need too many windrunners to raise the goblin's effectiveness. The world grows heavier at the implications. Spirit controllers and shamans may not be any stronger than the elven magic users, but I always speculated what synergies combining the classes from the enemy might achieve. We had seen similar results from our own experiments. Different races would probably be even more effective. Nash isn't even here to make this transfer more mana expensive. The world shifts the reality of our fight. We won't be able to step in battle with certainty of victory. Nor can we promise that only the rare unlucky sod and the stupid will die. No. Now the world has just been plunged into chaos again, and we need to build an island of order. Ajax's POV. The world crumbles around me as the knowledge I can do something about it burns in my mind. But my room is not the place to do it. I don't know the specifics yet, but I know the first step. The pyramids call me. I hear and see portals transporting thousands of enemy troops back and forth between their cities. Dad tries to hide it, to shield me from the realities. But even if I hadn't snuck into any meetings or infiltrated the network, I can feel that war is here. It stinks up the air and makes me more alert even when I try to forget it. The life stuff tastes funny. I wish I could ignore Nash's words. Pretend I didn't listen to them, but that isn't the truth of the world. A hint of his strange ether suffuses me, as the reality of the moment seems greater. I have an important decision. Do I step on the bicycle again after a car ran me over? Do I keep fighting after the dog's jaws let go of my ankle? Do I step into the pyramid after just having overcome madness? Do I step into a pyramid that is still a threat to me? One that will cause the system to invade my mind and rip away every hint of memory. A pyramid that is far away, knowing every step of the way what sits at the end. Yes, I'm in the best place to learn what the pyramids are all about, and even if costs my sanity, I will do it. I'm not weak. I'm not weak. I will do it. I get ready to step into the night when a cold air current hits me and swings my room's door open. I catch a shadow in the corner of my eye, and I look back, but there is nothing in the dark corridor. My mind is playing tricks again. Nobody is watching me. No life detectors or other mechanisms in range to give myself away as guards laugh at my antics. Atop the bed is the only important thing that I'm leaving behind. A tiny letter, with a wax seal leaning against my pillow and only three words of it seem of any importance. Love you, Dad. Chapter 306. Egypt. Ajax's Dad POV. The news I was bringing to Ajax seems so unimportant now. I want to step forward and stop him, but I can't. I know I can't. We aren't in the safe world I helped to build before the system. I feel him walking away, fighting against the horrors of the system. A single word gained ways in his mind. A word that Nash spoke to him, and that seemed to have become his ideal. A word I had repeated often enough trying to inculcate in his mind. He steps out of the window leaving a void in the room. A void that no mere sound or mere light could replace. I wait a minute before walking inside only to see the envelope he left for me. The barest hint of a sad smile graces my face. Dad, don't worry, I will be back, but I have things to be about. Responsibilites I cannot shirk. I hope you understand. Love you, Ajax. Yes, the hated word I taught him. I do understand. I wish I didn't, but I do. I look at the city that is my responsibility from the window. You aren't aiming quite this small. You want to protect this world, to become one of the shining beacons in our fight against entire empires in this galaxy, not just this city. Yet you are so young. The minutes pass as my mind comes back to itself and I find peace. I cannot shelter you forever. This letter just represents what I trained you to do my whole life. As much as it hurts, the world won't wait for anyone to step forward. It didn't even wait for you to grow a beard. At least you voluntarily took the first step to becoming a real man. Waiting for reality to smack you upside the head to get you into motion can be much more painful. My mind comes to balance and my own responsibilities, the millions of troops that need moving, the reinforcements of flying vehicles to allow those movements in a timely fashion, a constant stream of supplies and a thousand other details. Where we could best use our slow vehicles heavily reliant on chemical fuel or the mana highways for simple flying vehicles and even the much faster flying foe inner world ones. My request for reinforcements from Pando's village was denied and I understand their reasoning. 
We already have a small contingent permanently stationed here, and they have problems of their own. They need every troop they can get. Their casualties keep mounting. Casualties that I have no doubt will arrive here as soon as we start to confront the goblins in earnest. Closing the window pane, I step towards my own responsibilities, trying to find a way to reconcile our place in this new world. Void. Aspen's POV. Alone. Friend was taken by the ruthless eye in the sky. Nothing but the void of space. Worlds between me and Nash. No preparation and the friend of the forest is so far away the connection seems ready to break as it stretches to infinity. A connection I can only barely feel occasionally. Sure, there are plenty of people in the inner world, but none are him. The only remnants of Nash are gravity and lights kept in place by an extension of his will even from this far away. I know he didn't want to be so far away, but he is. He is on a land so far away that if I could reach Earth through the void, I would only be one step of a long journey towards where he is. I'm weak. So weak. I need to be more helpful. My friend always helps me, but now I have to find a way to pay him back. Thousands of seeds here and on Earth approach my level of power. Some haven't had time to let their roots fully develop. I cheer for their success, but I'm the oldest one. The first beyond Pando. I have a bond. I should have a bond. I should be more. If this keeps up, with everyone but me developing, I will fall behind to wither and die. The only special thing about me is the time I spend connected to Nash and the territory I'm allowed in the inner world. Even this will be taken away if I'm useless. He will cry. He will drag me around with his power, make a larger brain or gift me more ether than a thousand other seeds had received to try and make me greater. He will warp the world for me, but nothing he does will make me more than what I am. Not if I don't take this step by myself. I feel for the huge mana stores in my inner world home. It's far from infinite, but it recharges quickly enough and for the first step I prepare to use it all, though in a way that only a fraction of a fraction will be wasted. Drawing as much as I can, straining the limits of my willpower and control. I simply take from a battery, twist it into a knot, and send it to a different battery without relying on the runic traces. It's the barest of steps to my goal. But as my very mind warps, I find tiny adjustments to be made that help me move a little more mana with a little less effort. Nash's obsessive training for everything under the sun starts to make a hint more sense. This is what he seeks, the feeling of progress. The placement of a valued goal and the sense of motion that takes concrete steps toward bringing it to reality. My mind approaches his, as the thoughts of little old Aspen Seed are shed in place of the grandiose philosophy of responsibility in a human mental frame. Giving the whole of myself towards the goal, even if only for a limited amount of time, induces the purpose of motion. What starts at hundreds of mana points over days grows to well over a thousand without any external runic help, and that's when I feel the edges of my real limits. Before I simply didn't know where they lay. Not when alone. Not without actually training with a hint of Nash's mentality for days on, and instead of the sparse moments seeking our immediate survival. Still, even if I know that the easy gains are over, something drives me to keep going. There is a path forward in my current heading, but that path isn't enough. Like Nash's outlook on a significant portion of his problems, trusting his digestive system to tell him things. I know that this isn't the best way forward. I need to find soft and supple soil rather than breaking through solid stone. I keep going for hours still, trying to think of how to progress further. Growing the roots underground will do nothing, though I test that with a dozen other ideas just in case. Altering their shape into runes could be helpful in the right circumstances, and is my normal modus operandi. But my mastery of nature is something I already took to a very high standard, and now its help seems closer to a crutch to my actual goals. Sometimes it will be the right answer, but raw willpower is more versatile and closer to my goal. A flash of insight makes my entire world shift. An idea that I would never consider under normal circumstances. Not because I hadn't seen its beginning, but because I'm not Nash. I'm going to ask for help. In many ways, it's the same as we already do. But there has to be a way to make it greater. To meld the willpower of every single seed in the inner world in a single entity in truth at least when it comes to wielding mana. I broadcast my thoughts and invite every single one of the seeds. It's time to train. Trial. 
Nash's POV. Month 3 Trial. You have discovered the weakness of this beast and Hanley demonstrated your ability to defeat it. 99 slash 100 points. Path. I glance at the last month's system message. Now I'm minutes away from the fourth summoning, left wondering what kind of beast will pop up now. I needed to pay attention not to get crushed even by the first mob, the elephant. I should have never been in that much danger, that had been my lack of experience. To remedy that, the system simply makes the enemy stronger, and in many ways stranger. The trial seems off somehow. Even in the previous version, full completion and discovery of the easter eggs implied that someone could go above and beyond the system's limits and account for that. Sometimes by such wide margins that it wasn't even funny. It was expected that I could at most reach 200 meters of range if I somehow got my skill to level 200. Instead, I saw over a kilometer for myself in a sphere and a few of my inner world slash perception field tentrals reached well over a dozen kilometers. This, like so many others, is an aspect of the system that touched upon something more, but I just don't have context for the mechanics behind it. Mobs invisible to the system's perception field, easter eggs too far away to see with it at normal range, and so much more that didn't seem to suffer from the limitations of the system. I glance in the direction of a faint disturbance, a confluence of threads of ether that even when I arrived just a couple of months ago would have completely passed me by. The system is preparing for its mob spawning. I train my perception field in the region as my mind and body prepare to battle. Even standing there the breeze that somehow phases through the barrier on the edge of this territory. Nothing larger than air molecules passes it, but my mind just makes impossible plans to throw wrenches upon the system's works. That image got stuck there for decades, and it never really left me. I know the system isn't truly the enemy, but it still irks me often enough. The true enemy, the council hides behind layers and layers of soldiers attacking our world. They are so far away that the mere thought of striking at the root of the problem boggles my mind. So I will act locally. And right now, I only have a single enemy I need to contend against. My mind is trained for when the moment comes. But before this, I witness a temporal and spatial phenomenon that I try to decipher, but most of it still passes over my head. The barest of glimmers into how to replicate the feat is followed by a near erasure of everything imprinted in my memory, not by the system's actions, but simply the limitations of the human mind in trying to remember the configuration of a billion of folding edge of space stretched into temporal locks and supported through vast distances. But it's not about actually remembering how each tiny hair falls, but the physics ruling, feeding the right instincts in me. Each time I witness it, I build a clearer picture of how reality works until one day I will be able to replicate the feat. That moment is gone and only a single enemy is left behind. But this time it's not a giant beast, but a magic user and one that barely reaches my armpits. He sports a feral look, broadly resembling a goblin shaman, but even shorter in stature and there is not the same type of conscious intelligence in its eyes. Its mind only works at a similar level to an intelligent beast. No, it's closer like a beast that almost crosses to threshold of sentience. Even less than most of the bunnies I encountered in the instance. As far as I can tell, even if I gave it a push, it would fail the transition only suffering as a result. I may meddle with life, but there are intrinsic characteristics I cannot mess with. Nor is the desire for absolute control the correct mindset. With the perception field fully trained on it, I analyze every inch of its makeup searching for the weaknesses in its flesh, but a grimace pops on my face. The rules have changed again, haven't they? I don't give up the effort, making use of the time until it gets within range. At some 500 meters, I feel power thrumming just beneath its skin. He would rival Merlin in more ways than one. This is what we have to fear on Earth. Hordes of this enemy right now would wipe us out. With all my tricks and ways of empowering even the humblest of our fighters, some are only level 100. We need to grow a lot. Eventually, the enemy will be let off its leash. Even at this level without anyone else to protect, a single enemy is already straining my capabilities. And its level 200 plus skills are the largest portion of problem. Grocknish, level 276. A subsentient being of low stature, capable of instinctive use of magic. That line, it almost... 
A single point of mana fills the construct of a fireball and streaks toward me like lighting. Faster than a bullet, I almost failed to dodge even with my reaction speed. Willpower streams to my body shield and the potential chi I'm keeping in reserve ready. But the enemy, it attacked me from 400 meters away. That surpasses the normal range even from our best mage teams with mithril enhanced magical turrets. I wonder if even Merlin could do this. Though a single fireball wouldn't have killed me, it would add damage. Subsentient. I stare into its eyes and start to make sense of that word. It may not be a human, but its strategic mind is orders of magnitude greater than even the HLZ beasts and the last three mobs the system send my way. The little green bugger stands off, not taking a step closer, as it manipulates nature to grow defenses of its own before continuing its barrage of attacks. Lightning, wind, fire, and earth separate and together attempt to skewer me. My very first proper magical duel, and I'm going to end it all with a punch, if I can, as soon as I figure out his weakness and demonstrate it to the system with gusto. Dodging all but the rare attack that manages to corner me, I avoid using my scarce chi compared to my usual stores. I look closely at the enemy's attacks to decipher what gave it tremendous range and how it could possibly have achieved that. They come not like a thrown ball of dirt that simply kept its momentum, but fully controlled all the way through. Its fireballs are as cohesive at 400 meters as I would expect of a magic user of its rough power could shoot just 150 meters using normal skills. Just about the longest normal range we could reach without my inner world shenanigans. My perception field takes in the next couple of attacks until I realize the trick and a huge smile shines in my face. Driving my own will on the next fireball headed for my face, I extend my hand out, forcibly pushing his foe willpower out and finding no resistance. The attack almost explodes in my hand, but I slide my own willpower in place. It takes concentration to manage this, but this is only the first step. I don't need to actually turn the enemy's attacks against him. A loose pathway to victory, or at least stalemate, is before me. Oh, this is going to be interesting. Chapter 307 From near its maximum range, the Grocknish attacks no longer bring any meaningful danger. Each attack that comes my way allows me a greater understanding of the rune structure and the pseudo-willpower that gives the attacks this kind of range. I can't replicate the effect. I wouldn't even know how to start knitting it, but unraveling the thread that keeps it together becomes almost trivial. When I get closer, however, I feel a shift in dynamics. Unraveling takes a hint more of my attention, and it can shoot even more attacks giving it more chances to injure me. But nothing that worries me too much. After all, at this extended range, the willpower I'm supplanting isn't connected to anything living. But if I cross an unknown threshold, I doubt it would be so easy to unravel the attacks. Still, my mind attaches itself to the idea. It is a single enemy, and though I don't have the willpower of a hundred seeds to aid me, I have yet to encounter a single person with greater willpower than myself. Maybe Merlin could match me with skill, but in raw horsepower, few even came close. Holding roots, chi and even my other resources in reserve, ready to make full use of my power to escape before this new enemy. I start to advance into new territory. A real battle of magic against a single opponent. A hint of doubt creeps into my mind, but I should still be able to dominate the combat. At 300 meters the power of the attacks increases a small fraction. At 200 meters that margin widens. Then the shift comes as I reach 120 meters. The enemy reveals full command of its capabilities by infusing his actual willpower on his attacks and putting weight behind his every attempt to burn, freeze, or otherwise magically injure me. And at this distance, my attempt that I make to wrestle control away from its hands meets real resistance. Not the bare hint of a fake will, but a fully living power with a mind behind it. And even if I'm stronger, it is like trying to overpower a cat or a dog. Except this time, I don't care if I hurt my opponent. The fireballs come ever closer before I manage to take them away, with the range advantage compared to the Grocknish. I'm not able to use and abuse inner world portals to make the entire trip of the enemy attack like it was a few meters from me, but I'm still nowhere near the edge of my capability. This is only a stretching exercise trying to find my actual limits. The world seems off, 
by the tiniest of margins and I realize he is trying to veil my perception under an illusion. But although it has a partial effect on the system's skill, it does nothing for my own perception field. I throw a portion of my will against the delicate illusion construct dismantling it, while narrowly dodging a particularly strong water blade while at the same time I wrestle control from a magma ball away from him. Instead of returning the favor as I believe most mages would do, I simply shoot it to the ground. Sending it back just sounds stupid. Maybe when I'm closer he will have less of a chance to reconvert the familiar bundle of runes to his side. Then I finally start to spin my own attacks in earnest. Drawing lightning, fire, magma, water, and all the higher tier elements I learn to wield. Only to have the system fighting my creations. Still, even restrained by the system, my attacks start to chip away at the outer layers of its root dome. It never occurred to me given that I had yet to face anyone trying to steal my own attacks. But try as he might to wrestle control of my magic, he is fighting an uphill battle. A battle he lost before he even started given my usage of chi and its inherent properties. It's my resource. The trickle of mana he had been using until now, with incredibly efficient runic designs backed by truly marvelous will thickens up. Instead something closer to a real torrent of mana not only in the final effect, but in its very inception flows from him. I hadn't seen anything similar from single magic users, but still nowhere near the extravagant spending that I usually employed. My perception field absorbs it all, and I can clearly see the stores in his staff and belt supplementing his own pool. He isn't quite as limited as most single magic users I have encountered. If my impressions are correct, he probably has about 10 times his pool when adding both devices together. He triples the number of attacks and finally halts my advance. Fighting off the system and him at the same time is a little much for me. Getting close to it is probably not the way the system intended me to fight, but I want, no, I need to slap his face. I can't just forget that anything happened. I may not have a chance of fighting such a strong magic user for years to come in similar conditions. This is a rare training and gauging opportunity that I can't let go to waste. The semi-intelligent being's perfectly controlled attacks switch from conscious actions to pure instinct as it fires off a barrage relying entirely on something akin to muscle memory. I split off most of my mental stas to my second half who had been idle in wait until now and as his will blankets the area fully focusing on the magical battle, I step forward in the path of an attack. A faint cut from a pressured water blade gets past my other half's defenses and draws a hint of blood from my chest. But I just lean further on my movements and use the barest hint of chi to glue my feet to the ground which allows me to get in position. These tiny acts of will and magic are simply becoming an aspect of my own muscle memory. A point of life here, and there keeps any of the injuries from reducing my effectiveness, even if they don't fully heal me. Then I touch the roots. From a distance, I was having trouble connecting to them, but I'm invited as soon as I touch them. Simple as most plants are, nature has an appeal of its own. I don't even push a hint of my own resources inside. I simply ask them to give way, to split off into a malleable form, and they comply. The system doesn't take issue with my careful interaction, but the grocknish does. The very roots and brambles that had been opening the way to me, the simplest form of life, below any conscious level, but still beautiful and that I wanted to protect if I have a choice disintegrates before my eyes. I stare before turning to him. Now, I don't want to give a love tap as a warning if I could do it safely. Now I will rock his brain so hard. He is going to have trouble standing straight. I reach for the image of a steel spring in my mind, telling a story of the moment. A hint of ether flows out almost by itself as my natural ether field seems to flare. A warrior who has an entire arsenal of moments and my fingers blur through the air. The very blood in my arm tries to fill my veins closer to the extremities, but my body used to the forces simply keeps it at a manageable level. I hit the enemy's cheek with the full momentum of an arm, swing with four of my fingers which induces something unexpected. A moment of connection. A moment that lasts forever as time seems to pause in the strange way of my perception stat. I learn its history and I can see its soul almost too clearly where I catch a glimpse of it overlaid in the whole world, and where the enemy's is some three meters in diameter while mine is at about ten in that strange overlapping that was only now starting to make sense. 
Its history is strange. The system takes the grocknish places. The system considers it a useful tool, and I can sense the purity of its ether. It hasn't died to be brought back yet. Either an artifact of its powers, or it's protected by the system. This is an old creature. At least a few centuries with the barest glimmers of time magic suffusing its cells, and I realize so much more about the system. Maybe enough teleportation could have caused it, but I don't sense even the tiniest of threads of spatial energy left behind. So the system has put you in stasis, likely even longer than the people returning from the instance. Otherwise, I would have felt that there is something different about your situation, but the loose threads I pull on feel closer to my first hypothesis. I take his whole being in. He is an enemy and is trying to kill me. I will do the opposite of laying my head on the chopping block. Some of my past actions come to my mind and insight about my next action strikes with the force of cannon. Pity and miserliness well up in my gut while I split off the smallest sliver of ether and gift it to this mob, but I know I have to do this. This time to a full enemy, not even a mindless beast. Regret tries to drag me down as I realize this is what I should have done for many of the thousands of HLZ beasts I killed. I cannot do this for everyone, not as the numbers get more and more zeros at the end. But what I have started I must finish, and he carries potential. Potential like I saw in Ed the hundreds of boys and girls that visited Pando, like I saw in Onyx, my favorite wolf, Aster the bunny grandma, and even from that flying albatross. The moment breaks. Everything that the system and myself pulled from it is gone. The enemy is now inches from me, wields a different type of energy that seems really unhealthy for my complexion. So I take off running, so fast that I almost fear that my arms will start cracking the air like a bullwhip faster than sound itself. Logically, I know I'm miles from that kind of speed, but I'm fast enough to almost avoid the wave of black energy that me. The distance helps dissipate the damage and spreads it all over my body. I only have to deal with molten hair disintegrating clothes, and a thin layer of skin. Luckily, I don't lose even more than a few grams of living tissue. The energy tries to linger, but my other half manages to extinguish part of it while pushing the rest away. I only keep a hint of it in the inner world pocket. If it lingers, I will poke at it. My mind comes up with a hundred insights in that moment, and I try to tune my reforming personal shield with a little protection from that form of attack. A plethora of options for altering the rune matrix comes to mind, but I settle on just three to keep the complexity manageable. The enemy tries to explode roots underneath my feet to grab me, but although he does have some advantages, I'm a friend of the forest and trying to use roots against me is fruitless. I cross past 120 meters, but he still keeps shooting at me directly controlling the magic. That only stops when I'm almost 200 meters away when his efforts have to go back to the faux willpower. Willpower that is detached from a living being and only really useful against someone without my skill set. More common varieties of attacks come my way at the edge of its range, giving me a better glimpse of both the limitations of the technique and the barest of clues on how to replicate the effect. I don't need this specific skill with my portal shenanigans, but even if it's much harder, it might be useful for someone like Merlin, or possibly somewhere else I'm restricted, with only the tiniest trickles of life spread. I'm back to my normal state while the enemy keeps tapping deeper and deeper its mana stores. The fight is all but overgiven our relative running speeds. If I don't slow down, or turn around to poke at him, he will never catch up to me. It almost feels too easy, so I prepare to head in again, holding a pair of the very attacks he sent my way on my hands. Let's see what you make of this. Chapter 308 Earth spins in strange, turns as the flow of enemy movement gains momentum and snowballs their invasion. Footholds and advanced are being raised posts everywhere. Dozens of locations that we now have to balance if we want to try and keep them bottled up. I try to convince my friend of the simple truth, but he is having none of that. No, the enemy controls only a couple dozen locations, even if you consider the vast space between the few dotted points as their territory. Sure, we lost some ground, but that's less than a percent of the globe. I imagine wringing his neck out while beaming the correct information into his mind, but he simply doesn't see it. The worst part is that his arguments seem sound even if his conclusions are dead wrong. That's why I want to defeat him at his own game. So I reply. But that's not the point. They managed to break free. To find a way to really hurt us. 
Half of our strategy was to keep them bottled up. They now control dozens of points and have access to way more resources. It's been months since the wrong outbreak, and we developed shields good enough that their attacks are almost back to the former level of danger. As we have a large contingent of mages. Until they come up with another counter to our counter, as they almost managed half a dozen times. If they choose a large battle to reveal their next iteration, and it works. They might manage to trap and kill half a million of our soldiers instead of just scaring us with the possibility. Unlikely. They will probably have to find a completely new chink in our armor to exploit, and now we are a lot more cognizant of those. We are closing anything that might be exploited. They expose our weaknesses and we learn. He says and I feel him pulling away. He isn't convinced and I probably took a very unhelpful line of reasoning. That battle had already been a major turning point, and he isn't to blame for any of it. Relying on our knowledge of the enemy is a dangerous proposition. True. But this is war. There are no certainties. We both go silent in thought. We can take almost any place with minimum casualties. If we concentrate our mages in assault at a time, but our attempts to do that so far have taken the pressure off elsewhere, and that was also untenable. We can't just let the enemy run rampant through undefended stretches of land. There are less than 100 million enemies on our continent. We have the numerical superiority even only considering full-time soldiers on our side. But we aren't willing to pay the price to eliminate their forward outposts. Not yet. And any victory now could be made up with their near-infinite resupply of troops. Nash might be the solution. When he comes back, half of the planet expects him to snap his fingers and solve all our major problems. The ideal hero single-handedly accomplishes impossible feats. It won't be quite that simple, but they might be right, after a fashion. He usually relies on the backing of thousands or millions of people's efforts at his back to allow him to do the impossible things he does. If it actually happens, it might take the edge off our learning spree. People will go back to resting in safety, not driven to get stronger themselves. I don't know. This trial may be different. It has been months, and he hasn't returned. You can guess what will happen if they capture a second Mythil mine. Each one may only be a finite resource, but even half an ounce is enough for them to build a stronghold anywhere. He does tend to perform miracles, so we shouldn't discount just yet. But maybe you are right. Ajax's POV. My small flying vehicle uses the carefully engraved mana batteries in my faux inner world and giant tanks of water to feed the steam rocket. Others with access to a faux inner world had started to use kerosene and oxygen similar to the rockets, but the simplicity of steam appeals to me. So it's the option I chose. Even considering I'm only carrying myself, I can't go on forever, needing to replenish my mana stores in the mana highway once in a while. The trip was expensive, but as I approached the last pyramid with darkened eyelids and ready to cry tears of blood, I firm my resolve. Waiting a day might have let me recover and aid my broken memory, but that would simply delay the inevitable, not make it easier. If it's only one more I can dig a little deeper to summon strength. The minutes tick down until they are gone and only seconds remain. Each one tick of the clock is interminable, but then I realize that my feet are touching the last couple steps of a carved stone and I'm almost at the corridor entry. The entire memory of landing and walking up is gone. Maybe I'm worse off than I imagined. And this time, I didn't even bother to try a stealthy route. A pair of spears come out pointed at me but then recognition appears on their face and I keep walking knowing they won't try to skewer me. I may be stealthy, but my father has to have learned of my journey by now. He is as always prepared. I pass the guards who don't stop me and my step echoes in my ears in the narrow confines until I reach the central chamber and everything fades away. I head directly to the sarcophagus in the center positioning my hand correctly along the central axis of the pyramid, as I had done in all the others. Jumping to the ceiling along that axis and coming back down, the system takes notice of me. Others had tried the same, but for some reason, it didn't work for them. I don't know if I'm making their job harder, but now it no longer matters, not after it is already done. The soldiers and staff protecting this last pyramid simply wait in anticipation watching my tired, but determined motions. The system's attention builds for a moment until it grabs a hold of me taking me elsewhere. Immediately find the fastest way to return to Earth. 
That's the only thing that let me hold on to a shred of sanity in this strange gray world. You meet the parameters to unlock a legacy class. Error. System user already has a class. Do you wish to switch your class from A and asterisk MT hashtag 2, legendary, to speaker of the dead? Mythic, locked rarity. Yes, no. After skimming the prompt, I tap no. Not even considering the possibilities or the specific circumstances that led me to it. The fewer memories the system touches, my mind is blank. My memories are corrupted. Not the worst of it. I simply sit in meditation back in the middle of the pyramid, trying to recover, to piece myself together. In another minute, I get up, only to find no changes, nor any system messages. So I simply walk out, knowing this isn't over. Did you? Find what you were looking for? No. I say wanting with everything I'm to curl up and sleep. To rest, and let the world take care of itself. To give in, and let even the memory of my lack of memory fade away. It would be so easy to just be a child again. I look to the horizon and I know I can't choose that. I fear I still have one more place to visit. Where? The enemy's pyramid. You. But I'm no longer there to listen to his words. Mana surrounds me and a portal pushes my flying vehicle out, waiting for only a fraction of a second to gain a few meters of distance and avoid spraying the pair with superheated steam. I slowly turn up the power on my way back to Giza my home city. It's time to find a way in and nothing is going to stop me. Automaton seeds POV. Direct feedback on what is happening inside the nuclear reactor with the perception field lets me acquire the information I need. My stores of knowledge about how tech works, how nuclear fusion happens and this specific model help me predict the perfect way to react. My speed allows me to react in real time. Each day, the engineering Q, aka the real Q value rises. The ratio represents input and output energy, but not in a theoretical sense. This ration accounts for all the losses and with my help, it's only climbing. Now already reaching one, five for brief bursts, though most of the time I fail my attempts and stay near the magical one. The enormous energy output of my carefully tuned attempts is intermittently dumped into the grid to recharge batteries and be used at a cheap price for industrial processes that can work in brief and unpredictable bursts such as electrolysis. We finally have a minimally effective design, but it needs my direct guidance. The autonomous design is simply useless for now, and even on my best day, I can only control one reactor at a time. A hint of the lingering frustration that the pre-system researchers talked about hits me. A working design is always 30 years away. Another wave of news washes over everyone hindering their performance. The enemy is on the move. Nash isn't home, and the enemy has come out to play. At first, I simply ignored it, but that was growing harder and harder as the enemy gained more territory and forced more of our people to take to the spear or the staff, wielding stamina and mana into instruments of death. What had probably started as a half-panicked response now carried a reality I didn't want to lend credence to but I keep it in the back of my mind. As the moment passes, I find the proper mindset to start building on the fusion ladder. I easily cross a queue of 1.1 and everything extraneous fades away. Only a single thing is of any importance and it sits right before me. Repeating thoughts of the enemy are simply distractions while I'm working. I work on the small inefficiencies following the complex shapes for the plasma manipulated by magnetic fields that would certainly collapse upon themselves without my knowledge and skill, and they grow easier to balance. The motion of improving becomes my world. I won't let the shipbuilders get too far ahead of us. I will crack the code and provide another major attack avenue for our troops. We need it for yesterday. Enemy. We found it. I report to my superior. What? What you sent us to look out for a source. We know they must have a few with how strong and advanced they are, and we found one. Better yet, it's not just a valuable source, it's a mithril planetary source. I say failing to contain my glee. What are the readings? In between 10 and 20 grams a month without any upgrades. Holy Empire, the system must love these humans. Did the scouts give away their location? No. It was pretty much halfway through the journey and they didn't even need to get closer for a proper scan or stop to sleep nearby. We passed close enough to get good readings. I doubt the enemy has any idea. How far? Oh, that's the best of it. Less than 8,000 kilometers. 
That's still pretty far away. Yes, but well inside our envelope. Do we have a good distraction? I ask while pulling a map and unrolling it on top of the table to get a better picture of what is happening. We can steal their chemically powered airplanes. They are too fragile and small to be useful in the small numbers we can acquire, but should provide ample distraction. That will expose a few more of our capabilities just for a few planes. But that is not the real prize. It will draw enough of them away to make our main effort easier. Nothing else matters right now. Too bad we can't buy another portal to the closest outpost. Not for now. But with the right maneuvering, we can use the mithril inside. I tease out. Your mind is on the right track. Okay, call a few of the archdruids higher up the food chain. It's time to plan. Chapter 309. Practiced Motions. In the stillness of darkness and the deafness of true stealth magic, allow us to enter the human mountain outpost unchallenged. Even with all our skills we still had prepared for months to exploit a critical flaw in their main detection system. Those dirty humans with all their fancy equipment overly rely on life detectors, now blinder than even ourselves on what was going on on the other side of the continent. The one major kink in our plan is their other type of detection able to pierce all types of stealth we have without even the smallest of clues. But it couldn't always be present and watching especially now that they are forced to track thousands of our groups moving across their planet. A few of their smaller outposts are easy pickings if we detect their precise location ahead of time. And this critical flaw in the design almost seems purposeful, almost. As well-rounded as the humans are, considering they are newcomers, there is that qualification hidden in plain sight. Newcomers. The old archduid spoke the truth when he pleaded for us not to underestimate the enemy. We pass the last corridor to stand amongst the thousand humans, a good portion of which are sleeping, but we aren't aiming for their lives, not even that of their guards. No matter how stealthy we are, if somebody dies, they will instantly know of it. We didn't manage to subvert such an active system. Even eliminating a fraction of their numbers simultaneously would require way more than the 30 infiltrators I brought, and we don't have enough elves with the required skill level. There might not be ten elves on the planet left able to replicate this feat. So, we are going for the least protected equipment. Simple flying vehicles in this depot, likely meant to replace the sporadic loss near the field of battle. We keep making good pace through the corridors until all my conscious thoughts narrow. A red light turns on in the device I attach to my belt. Being connected to the enemy's network, I instantly know that it means. We tripped a silent alarm, blares in my mind. All caution lies out of the window, and we take off running. I stay behind for a moment to put a complex piece of runic working on top of the closest network node and turn on its shield. The automatic sequence starts and plays havoc in their vaunted network. Every local channel is filled with noise and garbled data delaying their defensive efforts. Running to the closest airplane, I shoot at the only inner world powered flying machine, which is sheer luck. That takes out the last of its rocket engines effectively grounding it. I would love to steal it as well, but that is just getting greedy. We hadn't planned for that, and there are probably more humans inside than the pair I can see through the doors protecting it. That doesn't even account for the security measures we haven't encountered. Bypassing them would require preparation, let alone the fact we lack space mages to directly access the space pocket because I doubt we can use their method. Still, I keep running at a full sprint, being the last to enter one of the planes even as it already has started to spin its turbines. Months of planning without even knowing if we would need to pay off. In seconds, we are taking off almost simultaneously only losing a single plane. A few scouts patrolling outside the hangar use their very flying bicycles as obstacles aiming for our wings or engines before ejecting. But in another couple seconds, we are beyond their limit of 20 meters altitude, just two planes short of the full haul. As the pair of long-range magical turrets with a good firing angle to our precisely chosen path tries to fire, the humans learn of our last surprise. No connection to the turrets. In another few seconds, we are out of its range. I assess our 31 flying vehicles finding all the damage is cosmetic. We manage to get them out from under the humans' noses. Now, all we can realistically hope is to draw enough attention we help hide the main effort for a little longer. And when it comes to something as important as a source, no effort is to be spared. 
The only flying vehicle that could have caught up to us is debilitated. Even if they have the replacement parts on hand, it will take them a while to switch out, but the deeper damage to other structures, such as fuel lines and sensors, will probably need a more deft touch. They hadn't had much occasion to repair their vehicles on the field. They usually rely on redundancy, mana shields, and F-distance from combat to protect most of their precious flying vehicles. With the shields being down during our attack, the only dangerous flying vehicle within hours of this place became easy pickings. We fly in a specific direction for another couple of minutes before a pair of our new planes skim the tree canopies and pull our reinforcements. The only real chance for those who were used to flying to get a glimpse of it again. Teams of druids and wind runners attach themselves with long kinetic lines flinging themselves in the air and entering the airplanes, before spinning their magic, allowing the pair of planes to catch up with us in no time. That's when the last part of the plan comes together. Kinetic links and careful maneuvering on our part distribute all the magic users with their mana stores between the planes. Then they strengthen those kinetic links formed as short as our pilots can bunch up the planes. Each airplane enters its designated spot in a carefully calculated triple-decker V formation imitating migratory birds. We get so close that the planes aren't just slightly overlapping their wings, which without magic would already play havoc. No, each plane actually gets its body between the overlapping wings of both the planes beside it in an ordinarily impossible maneuver. But we aren't just relying on technological means. Instead, even as someone who only specializes in a single aspect of magic, the stealth that my class empowers, I feel the majesty of the grand work of magic forming around me. The altered wind pathways are carefully guided by magic. Mana is being poured out at too high a rate for us to sustain forever, but while our mana backpacks last, we are going to be all but uncatchable. Our speed starts to climb not relative to the air around us, but to the ground as a bubble separates us from the outside. A bubble that relies on wind magic of greater proportions than I have ever seen this early during an invasion. A strange bubble grows around our craft, allowing us to break the sound barrier. Slowly we climb to just over Mach 1, 7 even though the planes still behave as if we are moving subsonically. The system may limit what we built ourselves. But that doesn't mean the natives know no to make the most of their own tools. Too bad, their security is too tight. If we manage to steal a few thousand planes, we would dominate them relatively easily. As we climb higher and higher in the sky, a second field of magic comes down. This one a low stealth skill meant to be used over large areas. It wouldn't hold up to close scrutiny, but there is nobody, not even their cursed trees for miles. Pando's Village Commander POV I watch a recording of the enemy going dark once again on my table's holographic screen. My office may not have many furnishings, but it has what I need and I play it on a loop searching over some clue. Even if the few seeds with enough range could still get the occasional ping, it was climbing higher and higher and would leave their range for good any minute now before a flying vehicle could get close enough that they wouldn't be able to escape. But why would you do this? What do you actually want? What is your final objective? This feels like closer to a distraction rather than the goal. They can't accomplish anything with so few people and limited fuel. In a couple of hours, we will run them down and then this distraction will be over. I change the screen to the movements on the ground and after a minute, I start spotting a few anomalies in the patterns of enemy movements. Nothing that would individually make this cycle any different from the dozens that came before, as it seems they like to do. Half of their numbers are on the move. One or two might actually hit a real target while the rest would join after taking a long way around and others would simply head back to the nearest outpost. This is a familiar pattern, but something is different this time. I just can't put my finger on it. We never know when a certain group is taking something important. And this is different even from the normal uncertainty. Are they? A new aide says with his head so bent that before the system, I would have thought he broke his neck as he tries to make sense of the map. What did you see? My voice booms in the room, and I startle him. I almost sense him close up, not accustomed to my forceful approach. With a fraction of a cent of a second to pull a breath, I purposefully soften my tone. Just tell me what crossed your mind. It might give me a fresh perspective. Swallowing dry, he speaks up. I, I think they converging on these four points. He says pointing at the map. It could be one of the smaller ones if they don't need too many to accomplish their actual goal, but... 
but spit it out, I say in a mild tone. It doesn't feel like it. What do you mean feel? I mean feel, right here in my gut. He says patting his gut through the uniform. So you are the second coming of Nash? No, I don't. I wouldn't dare. I let out a belly laugh, relieving the hours upon hours of tension as he stands around shuffling his feet. Logically, I know this isn't really all that funny, but the desire fills me and I need to let it out. Like all things, the moment eventually is over and with a fresh mind. I stare back at him. Everybody feels that, sometimes, maybe you, your mind, your gut, your instincts are uniquely suited to deciphering their patterns and you listened. Come over here. I became his over to teach him the controls until he is familiar with them and he started to look through the map. Maybe he will be able to go beyond what I had already seen. As he moves the screens, I follow his logic chain, or rather try to. Some of what he looks for is logical. Enemy concentration and heading. Others require more experience to understand, like terrain. But much of what he is looking at seems random. I can almost sense the puzzle forming in his mind, and I try to pull on the thread like he is doing. See? He points, and his madness infects me, and I doc. In the chaos of the movements that I analyzed for hours, I see. Yes, it was fairly obvious they were drawing in this general direction, but they must be coming through this side over here. It all fits together. If the groups didn't know where they were heading, maybe they wouldn't have given it away, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe a black hole will pass through Earth just shy of the speed of light and make all this irrelevant. I say offhandedly, before turning to him. We work with what we have, and we make reasonable inferences. This is a step in the right direction in analyzing the enemy's movement patterns. Send the messages out while I contact the seeds. Ah, you are right. With a narrower area to search, I point the seeds with perception feeds to the four areas the troops seem to head toward in search of what they actually wanted. If we find it first, we will be in a much better position. Running through the thousands, Tens of thousands of square kilometers of the loosely pointed area with a fine tooth comb would take ages, and the pair of exclusionary areas make the effort even harder, but if there is a chance that anything interesting we should try. Over the hours, the seeds make dozens of small discoveries, tiny natural or veins, gems to be extracted and even new types of plants, all of which will be of profit to us, but nothing extraordinary. I purposefully send people to rest cycling teams in and out of duty given we don't know when or even if we will discover what we need before the enemy. Then the time arrives as their direction grows from a possibility that fits what we knew into all but certainty. One of the locations ends up being a distraction as the enemy simply disperses back to the nearer encampments. Two others get ready to set up what seems like a temporary camp, one right on the border of a system exclusion zone and the other near a medium natural resource spot. But the last one calls my attention even if it's still unclear. We would probably suffer losses, even in the relatively favorable conditions for those two locations, but I still order plenty of our people to that position. But my mind is already on the last one, planning an assault on the last one. They get much deeper in the territory than usual. Deep enough that we lose track of them without the extra range that Nash's name brand perception field could achieve instead of the knockoff version that the seeds have. Long-range visual scans only give me a rough idea of what is happening inside. But then a sheer rock wall starts to slide into a perfectly chiseled entrance. The pit of my stomach drops. Now I'm the one to trust my gut when it tells me. We are screwed if we don't get the enemy out of there. I may not know why yet, but the feeling is solid, with weight behind it and I trust the dread. Chapter 310 Buzzing annoying words of the humans distract me from important work. I do my best to ignore their constant yapping as the fusion of stars unfolds at the tip of my fingers. Attention is paramount, as this is harder than walking a tightrope without a balancing beam. It takes absolute focus to make any progress, but each day I do a better job. Mithril, the enemy. We are screwed. A few words pass the filter in my mind and then I realized the buzzing wasn't the normal yapping. It's actually important. What? I ask, and the entire lab turns to my avatar. The root body I inhabit, even though it was actually only meant for Nash with his skill. Aren't you directly tapped into the network? The enemy discovered a mithril mine. We are assaulting it now, but 
it doesn't look hopeful. If they manage to establish a proper defense there, we might as well bunker until Nash is back. Exerting immense willpower, I draw my attention from what is interesting and follow the slow words, and then I pull on everything. All the scraps of data there is in the network, both public and moments later all the classified info. Not like anyone could stop me from doing it. 567 milliseconds later I realize how screwed we are. The military projections are dire. The most hopeful estimates put casualties in hundreds of thousands to take the mithril mine from the enemy and I doubt we could do it at all. Millions are heading there. And though they talk about Nash coming back to save us all, even he has his limits. Now is the best time to pick off the enemy, while they are sending reinforcements. Each one eliminated before they arrive to reinforce will make our job of driving them out easier. I have to step up now and bring everything in my power to help. I might not make much of a difference, but even if all I can do is stop a thousand random elves, it will be worth it. I look at my creation, our creation. It is not ready. It won't be able to produce the real amount of power it has the potential, but it has to be enough. Everyone, we are transplanting this reactor in the ship prototype. It won't work, says one of the researchers and nods go around the room. Yes, yes, it will I have the plans in my mind. I answer sending page after page nearly instantly drawn based on outlines I had thought about for ages. Oh, the sweet speed of computers. Enemies POV, mithril source. I didn't expect the humans would have been able to react this fast to us. I hear from my buddy while holding my staff ready to cast death and destruction on the enemy's heads. Don't worry about it. We have plenty of reinforcements and they don't have the gut to pay the price. Maybe. Do we have enough mithril to power a portal back to our city? We are finishing extraction now. Patience. The big hitters are going to be available soon. You ever seen a planet as crazy as this one? No. Nor of a source being found this early. But I'm not a historian. If the humans had gotten even a minimal defense inside, we might not have taken it. But they didn't find it in time. Bah. Very few planets find sources this early on. The system is not helping them just yet. With how things are going and how strong they are, it will take ages for the system to start nudging them in the right direction. Maybe we will even find another couple of these places. The enemy approaches even as our reinforcements arrive and grow the defenses of burnished wood in this land of fear. Fear that the humans still haven't properly learned to deal with. Now, you are going to pay for everything if you choose to assault us. Ajax's POV. I sit on top of the enemy pyramid, in complete stealth with thousands of miles of transformed desert around. Many would call my actions a waste of life stuff. Indeed, every hour I spend up here drains my life stuff stores, but only by a minute amount each day, and the place helps me keep on edge with this aspect of my stealth training. In my mind's eye, the seed in my pushes a rough picture of what is happening below like a sketch or a painting of what it is observing. Connecting myself to the seed too, closely somehow disconnects it from Nash and the gifts he passed on like the perception field. The seed can keep it at a few meters wide, but neither version is enough to help me in combat, not as things stand. And that doesn't even take into account how difficult it would be to maintain it at full power in combat. That skill belongs to Nash alone, and after a fashion, his avatar seeds fight by themselves. Third hand, Perception fields aren't a thing. I spend weeks recovering while looking for the smallest of exploits. The new unpatched dupping system. The endless source of EXP or the glitchy boss kill. I only have one more obstacle. I don't even dread the actions of the system any longer. At least not compared to the elves and goblins' actions. Entering the narrow confines with thousands of enemies is a death sentence. Every thought I explored is completely unworkable. The enemy never opened their shields, even if I somehow magically entered inside through the hordes rushing out to attack us as they had tried on occasion. I would be bumping against their physical bodies in the confined space, and if they closed the shields with me inside, I would be stuck inside for who knows how long if I somehow managed to keep my stealth. Weeks, months, maybe years. I could hide inside my seed's faux inner world if I extracted it from my chest, but then the seed would be fully exposed. I couldn't use my stealth skills from inside the inner world pocket. And that doesn't even account for the need to open a portal inside. Sustaining a tiny one inside my own body to let the seed keep a connection to its roots and the mana batteries was the most I could ask for. 
The enemy's pattern of movement shifts. The seed had an observation good enough that I don't even need to rely on my life stuff senses. Goblins teleport from their city to the other side of the world. Others stay in the tight confines of the pyramid. A ritual I don't understand starts. A hint of Myrthal arrives from the elven city as a few archdruids join with shamans. The moment seems important. There is a trade they already agreed upon and now. I get up with twitching legs and take a couple of steps, ready to make use of the opportunity if any present themselves. No thought, just action. Everything happens at once. A column of mana thicker than anything I ever witnessed explodes from the top of the pyramid, shooting like a beacon toward the sky. Enough mana to fully expose me and make my flesh boil with mana burns. Maybe even enough to actually burn me to a crisp. Even from meters away my life stuff consumption skyrockets to keep me in stealth. The enemy is clearly doing something, and then I see from the corner of my actual, I wear the thousands that just disappeared from inside the pyramid went. A single moment to teleport past all the protection and shielding in place in the middle of our barracks. Some type of teleportation that took them less than 200 hundred meters away. They started to wreak havoc attacking the half-prepared troops there. Elven and Globin magic users hit the defenses with enough power to obliterate most of them. There are layers upon layers needed to step out in full freedom in a critical place so close to our city, but even then it is bad enough. Then I see the tip of a cursed bone ram leaving the portal to the goblin city. They can't make the bends of the corridor, but teleportation solves that problem. Another levy of windrunners arrives from the elven city, this time not heading to the goblin city, but ready to rush out of the main corridor. Wielding both the talismans of the elves and the shields penetrating formations they might be able to escape, and we likely won't be able to catch up without flying vehicles. This teleportation must be fed by the pyramid which even buffs the enemy enhancing their already scary coordination to rival even our strongest warriors. Our own reinforcements seem muted and before I know what I'm doing, I'm on the corridor opposite to their mad rush. Its shields are down, and there are heavy patrols along with a small stream of enemies even on this side. But now, with the teleporting, the limitation is no longer the corridors but the portal. They must be burning their mana stores at unbelievable rates but I don't concern myself with that. I make the most of the chance I was given. I simply step forward, not daring to actually touch the walls. If even our own side had pressure detectors, so the enemy might have much more. Streaming an unwise among of ether to hide my actions and mana, I shuffle on the ceiling as fast as possible trying to avoid bumping into anyone. I glue my hands and feet half an inch from the wall and practiced motions over and over until I arrive in the central chamber. My heart thumps with such strength I fear even the sound dampening of my stealth skill will be overwhelmed. But nobody even glances at me. Instead, I keep lizard walking on the ceiling until I'm in the middle of the chamber in the lowest ceiling they constructed out of bamboo and drop along the central axis top of the sarcophagus, just past the pair of portals. A pair of scouts look in my general direction as I frantically feel for the system's presence. They rush looking for any disturbance. But moments later I'm no longer there. Instead, I'm in the dreaded place the system took me to inhabiting a ghostly body, in a dark forest with a message that I may not directly remember, but reading it rekindles something in my mind. Erased memories shaped and intended in my brain by the very scars the system put there. You meet the parameters to unlock a legacy class. Error. System user already has a class. Do you wish to switch your class from A and asterisk MT hashtag 2, legendary, to speaker of the dead? Mythic, locked rarity. Yes, no. I hesitate only for the barest moment before lowering my arm ready to tap the no. I take a deep breath with my fake body, ready myself to return and do it. This is the same message, so it will meet the same answer. New messages rapidly stream until a new prompt asks me to make a choice a much more palatable choice. Error. FJJDH. Error. System user has rejected all the Egyptian legacies. Hidden option unlocked. Do you wish to switch one of your subclasses to Speaker of the Dead? Mythic. Locked rarity. My mind spins with the implications. The end of my torment. Hints of the past before I poked at the pyramids grace me now. The possibility of getting my memories back. The enemy was ready to kill me just outside. The importance of my task while so many are dying for Earth. 
I try to talk to my little seed to find the empty spot as I already knew was there. My ether is gone. Everything that I could have used is absent. But now I have a chance and grab it like it's the last foot of rope keeping from dropping thousands of feet. Yes. My lousy level 50 subclass just replaced. I will get only 50% of the bonuses compared to a real class, but that is plenty for me. I expect to now finally be able to explore the dead forest, but the barrier is still there, and without a second of warning the system sends me back in the very heart of the enemy's invasion. I send a mana pulse through the calm rune in my belt of utility for help just as an elbow from a surprised elf catches me under the ribs. The goblin that did that is way more surprised than me. I shoot out a dozen packs of self-moving plants before I take off running. Each moves with a hint of my stealth skills and illusions to distract and confound the enemy to my actual position. If it delays them even five seconds, I will be safe. I manage to dodge a couple of enemies going through the back corridor as the warning goes out. I pass another closing shield just in the nick of time. But instead of relief, dread hits me. Before me is the last shield already at full strength. I have no idea what is going on with my reinforcements if any are coming, so I simply get ready to fight the only goblin in the same section of the corridor with me. Then, whoever is controlling the defenses activates the active part, not even giving the goblin inside a chance at life. Instead, they use the formations to flood the place with fire powerful enough to turn even stone into ashes. Panic rises and tries to dominate my mind. As my flesh my own man-child gets overwhelmed, but I pull on a system skill that is supposed to be about stealth and warp it. I infuse all my life stuff and even the hint of whatever Nash gave me into it, not sparing a hint ready to burn it all for a chance at life. I don't know where the knowledge and instinct to do it comes from, but I trust it with everything I'm. As the fire washes over me, I'm partially phased out of existence, while at the same time becoming even more real. A strange interaction I can't parse out grows with the purpose that life stuff induces flows through my veins. I feel the burn get to me, but that means I'm not dead yet. I can taste the absolute certainty in my path that ether can induce is only a millimeter away, but I keep myself at a distance. The dangers that most ether wielders have to deal with every day, only now manifesting to me. My skin shows second degree burns even with my perfect defense. I glimpse my path to freedom as the fire dies down. The rolling mass strained the last shield to such a degree that I now have a shot at getting through if I don't delay. I reabsorb most of the ether left, but leave what would normally be a wasteful amount in my legs and take off toward freedom while asking my seed to open a portal to my faux inner world. I pull out a formation that hadn't been precisely designed for this situation, but it's close enough. The seed in my chest struggles to accompany my speed, especially under the restrictions of the enemy domain, but it manages in time. So I swing the talisman, while infusing as much mana and life stuff as I dare in the weakest spot in the shield. Trusting that it will be enough, I slam the explosive formation in the moment it goes off against the shield. A nearly invisible mana spike disrupts the shield with a similar mechanism to what the enemy was doing to our own shields. So close to it, my skin tears and I feel weakness wash over me, but a path to freedom opens up. I poke my head and one arm out through the quickly closing hole, fully exposing my back to the enemy. I try to push farther just as someone from our side, the strongest warrior in the region wields a mallet that probably weighs half as much as I do. His skin shines with conflicting glows from two active skills coming up simultaneously. I half expect him to drop to the ground twitching uncontrollably, but he keeps his wits about him and in a single move that would surpass even Nash's strongest blows, he hits the shield. The very air cracks with the impact and the pyramid vibrates. Black spots show up in my vision. As another goblin arrives and swings its sword at me, but arms that could have ripped tree trucks from the ground pull me into an embrace into safety. Then another spell through the small hole in the shield and only darkness remains.